welcome back to Old Mate Yarn, episode, what are we up to now? Five? Episode five. Of course, you know these two blokes by now, Dean and John, actors, legends. We also have Jordan Allison, director of photography, uh, gaffer, head of cinematography, head, head of cinematic at Sun Studios. What else? That'll do. It's, uh, there's a laundry list of things, but it's not as impressive as it sounds. Um, Boys, thank you for, thank you for having me. It's nice to sure. be here. It's, um, it's, it's been a while since I've seen a lot of you, probably since we shot the bloody film, eh? Yeah, not yeah. far off. Yeah, man. Oh, yeah, last time I saw you. Was How long ago was the dance? The dance. Oh, oh, hang on. We have another one. We have a mysterious is. extra guest joining in. He's made it. Hello, hey. gents. Can y'all hear me nice and clearly? In the name of Jordan. Very clearly. Jordan yes. Mason, Mason Jordan, before anything Hello, else. Mason. Nice How to meet are you, Jordan? I'm good, my man. Yourself? I'm good. Look the gimmick the here is we've all identified. Yeah, the gimmick here is that we've determined that I'm the cinematographer, which means that my image must look the best. It does look fucking solid. I'll Doesn't give you it? that. Doesn't it look great? It's so solid. So there's, there's, maybe, there's maybe like forty forty five thousand dollars worth of equipment going into the setup right now because <laughs> I can. There was a brief moment of time where I thought about bringing out the Ari Alexa and some like manual uh, cinema lenses. I have like a set of ultra primes just sitting in the other room right now, staring at me. And I thought, you know what, that would be a beautiful thing. But I've decided to go for a, a slightly more discreet, um, slightly less expensive setup, mostly to show that I I can do many things even with a tight budget. This is a great advertisement. It's funny you say that because I was I was just before getting onto this, I was trying to plug in my actual nice microphones to do a similar thing and then I just picked up my headphones and gave up. Yeah. <laughs> See, this, um, <laughs> You're hearing me through this. Already watch the... <laughs> my, my skin looks really watch small Watch that not work when he plugs it back in now. Did you enjoy that? Oh my <laughs> god. Are you serious? My skin looks really small. Well, small. The DOP's yeah, right? got this like amazing setup going on, and he used to put so much effort in. But the compute, the composer, sort of music guy, sounds like a fucking dude on a Call of Duty lo- lobby with a twenty. <laughs> from that's Kmart. because that's John. That's because that's also what I do. <laughs> that's that's When's um, the part where you tell me how you're gonna fuck my mom? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's so funny. As I plug the microphone back in, it triggered, I, like my Spotify. And on my Spotify, it was a comedian, Pablo Francisco, but none of the jokes, it just, like, all the clapping from it just started appearing as I, I unplugged it. I thought it was some sound effects or sound design. No, it was just me doing no, sound nobody's design. nobody's applauding here, I'm afraid. On my own oh. oh, my gosh. You actually do have sound effects. Are you I serious? <laughs> do you know the worst thing about that is how it just cut off? This is the sound engineer in me. There was just the clapping and then just silence. You didn't like that. How, it, how about this one? Oh my gosh, you complained. <laughs> now you're composing the scene. Oh, how is he doing this? I should know. This is my version of Jordan doing what he's doing. I have the power. It feels a bit of Rocky Horror Picture Show. Oh, yeah. It's going to keep going the whole time. I, I didn't have that, so it's going to keep going. Oh my god. Okay, that's it. That's funny. Like, God, we can't just have like the first four minutes of the opening being us flexing on our setups and then just rocking out to some fucking sick shit. <laughs> yeah. Surely that's not allowed. Surely that's against podcasting regulations. You gotta do that little well, ending. It, it does sound like a podcast intro, especially that ending. Really? <laughs> sure <does>. Welcome <laughs> back to the last week's. Oh, I don't know, last week. I don't know. I'm terrible at this. Um, <laughs> how does the screen look, everybody? Like, Mason looks like really small. Five boxes. I'm small. I don't know. You look small, and you three guys look big, and I look medium sized to small. Yeah, looking like the Olympic rings on my side. Yep. Yeah, I got Olympic that's rings. A great, as well. That's great. Ah, how do I get Yeah, that? I also have the Olympic, Olympic rings. <laughs> Why don't I have Olympic I don't think rings? I'd worry too much about it, Mr. Kit Savage. I think it's probably <laughs> just a, a your end <sighs> thing. The recording will probably turn out fine still. I am on a phone. That may be it. Huh? That's, that's probably it. it. Can we just start with the fact that our beard game is strong? Well, Across the board. You think? It's not bad. So In the starch the department, we, 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 you know, Jordan and I might have a little bit more of a length, but the starch department across the board. Yeah. Whoa. 
I would argue that it's potentially true that the moustaches are higher quality than the beard moustaches. You know, if, if you have, it's like I've focused all my energy on the chin and spent no time thinking about my upper lip. <laughs> so true. I actually commend you guys. I, I, my chin hasn't seen the light of day in, oh, I don't know, probably half of my life. Has the gimmick is, I don't have a chin. This is just, this is the thing to, to maintain the illusion of a chin. You were born with a beard. Yeah, it you just were. means that correct. neither of you are going to get chin skin cancer. Well, that's something. I guess I can look forward to that. Very true. Is that so I, I won't get upper lip cancer, so. <laughs> I would say it's between either, either John or Mitch. It's the, the stash particularly on display. I think, I think John, for sure. John I've been trimming my moustache to a one. See, no, I need to be doing that. I need to be doing this more than I'd be doing that because there's things that I can do. Moustache one. Dino sitting here. two. One here. Yes, Dino's yes. sitting here quiet because he knows that just like if he really gives it a crack, and I've seen it, he can just blow us all out of the water. Really? <laughs> I, have, oh, yeah. I have a decent beard yeah. in the flood, yeah. Yeah. No, I've, uh, I've seen it in like do. movies. Oh. Yeah, when Dino has a beard, it is fucking glorious. That's oh, a, is there a, a photo of going around that we could see of this? <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm impressed. Sure is. It was like a bush. Was, I mean, I think yours would rival it, to be honest, Mason. This is actually, you know, you, you were talking about the sizes before. Mine is is just like compartmentalized, forget about it, and then like two weeks later, look at yourself and go, whoa, it's a bit long. You're <laughs> talking about beards, right? Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's where Mitch, you put the like, bah, bah. <laughs> I didn't get it fast enough. I love it. Bah, bah. Oh, yeah, it's like we need like a sixth individual just to be on the soundboard, just to, to really <laughs> accentuate those amazing, amazing <laughs> one-liners. When they watch it in the actual movie, they're like, is this just from the fucking podcast that isn't a podcast? <laughs> luckily, luckily, Ooh. I then edit this, so I was oh, like, oh, no. damn. Oh, First of all, Oh. What the fuck? Oh. Oh. Yeah, that is pretty sick. Do you know the funny I thing was under the impression that I was straight. <laughs> turn it upside down, it almost looks like hair. It's so frizzy. My gosh. I really miss yeah, those lenses. Noise is going to happen. Give me a second. They're the first uh, <laughs> glasses like... I ever got as a, a person losing their close up eyesight. Like oh, running... $700. $680 for those glasses. Your hair through it. $700. Oh. <laughs> 680 maybe, if that's with the eye test. Worth every the penny, eye test. you look gorgeous. But I broke them. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> oh, no. And now I just get $30 piece of shit chemist ones. But I probably that's spent really $680 He's on those ones in the last... sensible adult. But I probably spent $680 on them in the last four months. So I continually break I, down. Um, the ratio doesn't hold up. I bought one very nice pair of sunnies, and I just knew when I bought them, I was like, this seems like a bad idea. And then, like, three yeah. days later, I was yeah. down by a lighthouse near the harbour, and just into the harbour. So, yeah, <laughs> cheap ones ever since. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. Never, never, I've never broken or lost a cheap pair, ever. I periodically just go to Bali to get some. <laughs> I always come home with five. That is the most last... Perth thing I've ever heard. I don't know. It totally is. In fact, I'm, I'll probably... i got to stock up when I go there in like two months' time. I kind of want to know how they fell in the water. Photo with... Yeah, actually, yeah. <laughs> what? How the fuck? Them in the water? No comment. Uh, were you on the water or beside the water? Like, I there... was on some... We... Down near a lighthouse. We... With... You're else. drinking old mate beers. And I was not. I didn't have old mate beers. Had I had old mate beers, I may have been drinking them. But this was uh, a couple of years ago. Um, that is the worst product 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 product. I have ever heard in my life. Oh, we have been plugging them pretty hard. We have been just plugging like them hard. I don't know. Just the, <laughs> did you do this? No, but <laughs> goddamn, I could have. I tell you what. I was, yeah, I was expecting you had one sitting there and he's holding it up, like. Them, actually. I was expecting you'd have one uh, there on drinking. The, I had a massive up. weekend. I am drinking. I am off. Massive weekend. There's more for... to this. Do explain <coughs> this massive weekend. Oh my god. I, I've got some old mates of the week. I'll tell you what. Um, Jordan, oh, ahead, ahead of time at the end, uh, we have an old mate of the week. So give, give yeah. a heads up. <coughs> Does somebody <laughs> want to run me through what the hell this podcast is all about and what, it's if, not a if podcast. any, 
There is not a yeah. podcast. What okay, this not all, podcast is about. No, yeah, no. First of all, it's a um, a a personalized um, oral discussion or pod for short, but it's um, not a podcast. But we broadcast it. Yeah. To uh, the rest of the world, we, we do, and we have, <clears throat> and we have interesting conversations with um, talented and interesting people. But it's not that <clears throat> podcast. It's just Where are you going to find the talented or interesting people? I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> We're yet to have any. I'm kidding. Um, I take that back. If I could describe Australian wit as one thing, it is that. It is being like, let's just get a bunch of amazing people in a room together and then describe how none of us are amazing. And that's the yeah. joke. Yeah, <laughs> wait till we make a movie about it. It's going to be great. <laughs> it's all poppy syndrome is our thing, isn't it? I know, isn't it? Doesn't it suck? Like I was there, So yeah. day, I think, two of this uh, weekend that I just had, we were at this um, Saints vs. Sinners party and... This woman lost her phone. So I was like, what's your number? I'll just ring it. I was just sitting on the couch. I was like, this is a lot. And uh, yeah, and she goes, um, that's really sus. And I was like, I'll just, I'll, you lost your phone. Phones are important. I'll just buzz your phone. You can see if you can find it. She's like, that's, the, <laughs> you know, fucking trying to get my number and shit. And I'm like, all right. That's, that was my first thought, like, though, I've got to say. Well, then I just <laughs> buzzed the phone a couple of times. She found the phone. She picks it up, and I'm like, didn't realize it was her. So I was like, hi, if you find this phone, can you please, you know, take it to um, Mrs. Claus and a big M&M, but I don't know why they were at a Saints vs. Sinners party. Now, I think about it. <laughs> anyway, what? This they were, that, that's what they were dressed as. Um, and uh, then I, you know, track them down, and it was the people with the phone. And she's like, oh, thanks, you're so sus, and walks away. And I'm like... <laughs> I just helped you find your phone. Fu- so yeah, we're living in a day and an age where Thanks, that's, so that's nice. stuff now. That could have been your <laughs> old that's just, like, that's, just modern, that's just modern flirting, right? Like, basically, she's saying you're she sus. with her like, boyfriend, the big M&M. <clears throat> doesn't matter. I thought the punchline... starts line like that, be, you can beat out the big M&M. I thought the punchline was going to be, she, they had this whole to and fro of, like, she's, no, no, that's sus. They're like, no, I'll call your phone. No, it's a bit sus. And then she calls, you call her phone. And it's in your front pocket. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, got you I've had it the whole time. <laughs> uh, would be sus. <laughs> One big ad campaign for old mate. Burr, burr. <laughs> <laughs> oh, was oh, that a beer? Also, in terms of plugs, us down at Rocks Brewery, well, the brewer's down at Rocks Brewery, not me, just made this absolutely Ooh. cracking. It's... Backwards there, but it's called Strawberry Time. And it is a candy strawberry sour. It is fucking delicious. I'll tell you what, if I wasn't on a podcast, I would walk very slightly around the corner to Rock's Brewery (laughs) and go and get some fucking Strawberry Time. Instead, I'm drinking something from a competitor that is also good that I won't describe that is Mandarin flavored. Well, it's from (laughs) Yuli's. Mate, they come and and steal shit off all the time. What do you Your drinks have branding. What, if, what, what do you think this is? I can't see it because you're uh, really small. Uh, looking at you, I'm going to say a rum and coke, but I don't want to put any <laughs> labels on you. <clears throat> that looks like an iced tea. Yeah, Ooh. right. It's, it's, uh, it's, I like to call it sweet brown, but it's brown cream soda. Outstanding. Okay. Cream soda. Absolutely. They all, all of these delectable. Look at it. It could be tea. All, all of these names kind of sound oh, like. Can you tell I've done so? Pound searches. Yeah, that's sweet um. Brown. That's about right. I don't want to know. I don't want to watch the porno for sweet brown. That doesn't sound like. Right. I've also never used the word porno in my life before. Apparently, being recorded makes me into like a weird 1970s gentleman. Sorry, bro. <laughs> I've never perused in this pornography by the name of Sweet Brown before. I don't know about you. <laughs> you have the, uh, what's the you full have name? The of strawberry. What was your? Yeah, name? the strawberry, strawberry thing sounded sour. Uh, strawberry candy. Strawberry, strawberry, strawberry candy sour. sour. So it's like a sweet <laughs> strawberry sour with like a bit of vanilla taste going on to it. It's fucking <clears> absolutely on the money. And so we'll be in tomorrow to buy some. That sounds fantastic. This is me doing my uh, hero shot from the Canadian Club commercials, except it's with our beer. So you're just like, oh yeah. Hey Terry, do you want to be? Here I Terry, more shit. You want to be? 
That was I'll great. At the right angle. You know, beer is a weird thing, right? So I was down in Melbourne uh, last week sorting out some Sun Studios related shenanigans, <clears> just <throat> seeing <clears throat> what offerings we have down there. And I said to the guys, hey, I want to go to a bar. Like, I don't want to go out with any of you because I'm not that kind of person. No offense to them. But I want to go to a bar. What do you recommend? They said, you should go to a Heartbreaker. And I was like, Heartbreaker sounds like a bar that's up my alley. You know, like, what's, what's the vibe? And like, it's a bit punk rocky. It's a bit rock and roll. And I'm like, cool. All right, sweet. A bit Frankie's Pizza vibes. A bit Mary's back in like 2008. That kind of situation. And they go, guys, it's got the best beer in all of Melbourne. So you should do it. I'm like, all right, cool. Let's go have a look. So I get there and I rock up. And first of all, they've got pizza by the slice. That's an excellent time. Whoa. The ordering process makes no fucking sense whatsoever. I never quite figured it out. They gave me, I ordered two slices of pizza. They gave me two guitar plectrums. And I went, I don't fucking know what to do with this. And they were very unhelpful in that regard. However, the pizza was wonderful once I figured it out. The next what? part of the story, however, though, is I looked at the beer menu and literally every single beer they offered was from a brewery within a three square kilometer of my house in Rosebury. So apparently... <laughs> The best beer in Melbourne comes from the inner west in Sydney. <laughs> what, what, I, don't figure. I literally do not doubt it. It was literally just Filter, Grifter, um, Yoli's, and Wayward, which I guess is technically Camperdown, but that doesn't yep. count. They're I'm missing one. Fucking Melbourne one loses. One. <laughs> well, I tell you what, if, if you work for, uh, for Rocks, you should get in contact with uh, Heartbreakers now available at a nearby pub near you, and uh, tell them that you've got some six fucking rock and roll beer. Put some uh, old mates in there. See how that goes. Ba, ba. <laughs> <laughs> I almost had a crack at AFL. Yeah, it Football really does ring. not have the same effect when somebody just says, ba, ba, ba. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's a symbol it invokes. People will be left with this. Every, life will just become a commercial. It already is a commercial. <laughs> is that the definition of late stage capitalism? Like we're just living a life where everything is a commercial. It is. How many I mean, YouTube even you videos... saying that. Yeah. Like commercial. Yeah, pretty much. Jordan. Even when it's you like, watch... ladies and gentlemen, we're back. There's five of us here. We're just a bunch of friends talking shit. It's also a commercial. <laughs> what do you mean? Sweet brown. It's not wrong. <laughs> Mate, your little box is just an ad for Sun Studios. <laughs> uh, don't want to talk about that. I could have got much more expensive shit out, <laughs> but that's a. Isn't this whole thing that's a an separate ad for situation. Riverside? Technically. I feel like nobody knows what Riverside is if yeah, you're not a no. podcaster. I just said so, that at the top uh, of the screen. I That's all I know. stumbled onto it. Um, yeah, I mean, I pay them so that it doesn't need to be. In. <laughs> <laughs> they don't need our support. Mm. Nope. They there don't, are they other podcasts. They, 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 they do. They do the problem with with John Stewart, and so now now it's a now it's a podcast. Um, yeah, no, I stumbled onto them. They're great. It's uh, it's a good time. Um, I. Uh, left a review on this site that I've never been to before, and they gave me a $50 uh, Amazon voucher. That sounds like uh, bribery to me. To be it honest. sounds like straight bribery, <laughs> and I did it, and it was what worth it. did you buy from Amazon? I haven't bought anything yet. Um, I was having a look, and I realized, I was just scrolling through Amazon, like, you know what, I actually don't... I'm the worst person to live in capitalism, because I genuinely cannot think of a single thing that I... Need right now. LED That's a rare gift. Light bulbs. <laughs> yeah. Just Do you want me to go get some colored light bulbs? We can play this game. <laughs> we can just mention things, and I can go find what them. What do we need for old mate? Let's get. What do we need for old mate? My kit list is a mile long. I got some Kmart lights. That you can program them from your phone. Could be good. What's the uh, TCMI rating on those light bulbs from Kmart? <laughs> out, of out of curiosity, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> the thing on it's Friday yeah. rating. How do they how do they hug the um, the white balance curve? Like, do they do they skew magenta or green? <laughs> they only last for like two hours. Mason's like, you know which way they skew? <laughs> Perfection. <laughs> it's so good. Oh my gosh, that, we're gonna hate that by the time we get to the like. <laughs> reading of the movie and it's all over and we're just like fuck hear that again it'll just trigger us the movie is just 40 minutes of two guitar <laughs> riffs back and forward there's no actual dialogue turns out like the audio guy ran away with all that and now it's just <laughs> that's how we substitute it it was just like cool let's just every single time a scene transition happens we'll just add dun dun we just speak it. in it like a Bruce code Wayne and bass licks I mean, that's exactly how that worked. I'm pretty sure that entire thing started because they were just like, 
Uh, we have lost all of the end dialogue to any of this. <laughs> so, <laughs> magnetic strip film doesn't exist yet. We can't embed audio into the track. Fuck it. We'll just figure some shit out. <laughs> <clears throat> oh my gosh. I'm trying to think of an old mate of the week, you know, just for the, oh man. For the end. But I'll be honest. Perth wasn't dishing out any good old mates this week. Well, you like, can just right. come back from a naval base. Can you speak about that? <laughs> Actually, I'm not allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> that that is the most naval-based story I've ever heard. It is. It's so... Actually, no. It's like Fly Club. I will say one thing. Even if I'm... I don't know if I'm allowed to say... Well, that has no context to it. I did a, um induction earlier this week to learn about safety. Um, and, and in that, I learned about... Um, oh, I'm going to get the naming of it wrong. Let me, I need Google up next to get this right. What's the stuff in concrete... Uh, concrete dust. It's called silica. That's it. Crystalline silica. Anyways, very similar to asbestos. Um, anyways, it's actually in a lot of stuff, such as concrete, rocks, bricks. Anyways, um, we heard that in the in the Dutch in the Dutch, and I was like, I have no idea what this stuff is. And then today, some guy was like putting some concrete shit in a in, like bag around us. And I, uh, I saw all of that dust and smoke and then felt shit afterwards too. Like I could, Ooh. after the guy explained to me that like once it gets into your lungs, just like it's supposed to, that shit ain't coming out. Oh. Um, and obviously in a modern day time, like it's something that would take a lot of longevity. It's not like something that uh, <coughs> you die overnight. Um, but, you know, anyone working a job like that, for 30 to 40 years constantly surrounded by it. So anyways, my brother walked up to this guy and was just kind of like, look, do you mind just doing this like a little bit elsewhere? We're inside the building and it's just, you know, no windows, everything's closed up. And I guess this old mate was just kind of like, okay. I moved over here to get away from others. And then my brother was like, could you move completely elsewhere to get away from us? Just kind of thing. And it was just like, <laughs> anyways, he's got, I've got one more bag to do. And my brother's like, all right, whatever, cool. We're still like further away, so it's all cool. And we uh, checked with him later. And my brother, same thing, he was just reluctant. He was like, oh, I've got work to do. Meanwhile, he's wearing a massive mask and protecting me. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there like, fuck me. Wow. Um, what an old mate. And it was so funny and ironic that safety, <clears throat> like a, a safety supervisor will come by and go, where's your glasses? You know? But... Something that you breathe into your lungs. Ah, 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 whatever. We'll just let it, let it run. It was just one <clears throat> massive, massive slap to the face, um, to the whole safety thing, really. So, but like I said, I won't speak of who this was with, but like mm. it's just amazing when, even though you get taught the rules, um, you know, you know, it's just some people just blindly <coughs> are like, nah. <laughs> so you have a in <laughs> Half the thing with the inductions, I feel like it's not important to teach you the rules of safety. It's important that I told you the rules yes. of safety, yeah, so exactly. I'm not right. Exactly. It's yes. really much an insurance thing. It is such an insurance thing. And don't get me wrong, we don't want to hurt anybody. But it, um, but people also got work to do. And sometimes when they're just doing their work after a 12 hour day, you know, you just see people just like, yeah, just not care. It's pretty crazy. So my old mate of the week, I guess I did have one. You did. <laughs> it sounds very much like you had an old mate of the week. I would argue maybe there's a second agenda here. Maybe he wasn't an old mate of the week. Maybe oh. this entire thing was a construction, a construction with a deliberate assassination attempt on your life, Mason. Okay. And that they figured that the most... Uh, innocuous way they could possibly do that was through sig <laughs> was through fucking silica. cement silica. 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 And they were like, we'll add the icing to the cake. We're going to like bribe the guy at the Navy that apparently Mason needs to go see because Mason needs to go see a man at the Navy and we'll have him tell him about the silica so that he's aware of it. So he can die knowing that that's why he died. When this comes up in a lawsuit in precisely 12 years' mm. time, um, follow the rules. Do you think that they're going to use this podcast? Sorry, this chat with old a bunch yarns. of mates. Yeah, these, these, these yarns of old mates as evidence. They'll be like, this was, he mentioned it. He mentioned it on the day that it happened to him. Let us put it on the legal record that this is not a podcast. 
right but back. I find it We're awfully already... convenient that a man named Mason was killed by concrete dust. Oh! <laughs> Our next movie idea. That's fantastic. I like it. That was exceptional. Yeah. What kind of movie idea is man named Mason killed by concrete? What's the log line? Can you give us the log line of that film, Mason? Big discussion about corporate companies dismissing human lives. Mason being one of them. Anyway. Mason, the hard-working sound engineer. Uh, constructor <laughs> con. The, the overseas cement manufacturing company starts a warehouse across the street. The man fights back against the noise complaints but is slowly succumbed to the silica. Written by chat GBT. Exactly. What do we call it? Harden the F up. <laughs> oh my gosh. Concrete we'll call it a spoonful of. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. All about not to harp on about this, but is this how this podcast goes? We yeah. just. Sorry. Generally not, this not, yarns. God damn it. I just can't get At some point, we should probably talk about, like, movie stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's usually John, yeah. actually. It's usually John who just goes, like, so have we got any questions? I was like, oh, we do, actually. <laughs> I think that's John, thank that's you for keeping us all on track. There is no track. Yeah, let's have some Reddit. Um, there, there is no question. track. There is no track. Reddit question. I received a question today. Also from Reddit. Also from um, the filmmakers subreddit. Should we, should, we do, should we do a little bit of questioning of Jordan first, Bart? Because he's like the, new, the newcomer. Like, uh, so, Jordan, when, when did you and Mitch meet? And what brought you on to the project? <laughs> I like that. Yeah, yeah, we should. Uh, I mean, you can continue to ask questions only if you use that, that exact voice. voice. I yes. think that's very important. What, 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 is, what informs your work? Informs my work. No, okay. but, the, but like, how, yeah, you, you and Mitch, what's the work in no, relation you to there? you already changed it. No. Yeah, we need to, uh, yeah we, need to, we need to rewind back to the questions that we're asking True. on the first one, that we shot your, your guy's way and shoot them Jordan's way. I All think right. that, is a, that is a great first question, and we'll, we'll just... Uh, it stands. Jordan, how, okay. did we, how did we first meet? I, well, was a lot first of all, I'm going to have a swig of this delicious uh, unnamed competitor's beer. Mitch is like, Jordan, how did we actually fucking meet? <laughs> <laughs> how did we actually meet? How did we meet? Mitch has actually meet? entirely forgotten how we met, so now I no, have to I, describe I do, it to uh, I, I do recall, but I would love your version of, of, this, of this story. Both of you are on the uh, jury? Mark he was drunk and dropped his glasses in the water and... <laughs> I lost my phone, and then Mitch offered to uh, call it for me. Um, Jordan was Mrs. Claus. I was pouring Howdy. cold bleach one day. Can I introduce you to the brown M&M? &M? <laughs> my... <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, the, uh, the story, story time with Jordan, I guess it's a, a, weird, a weird thing to say. Um, how much have we talked about um, the organization that you and I were working for, Mitchell? Ooh. Uh, I, yeah. Should I be dropping names and doing bits and pieces? Go for it. Um, okay. we, I don't think I'll we've actually really talked about it much. On Outrageous. The yards. Go for go for Doc. So I suppose that we should start at the beginning, as all good stories should start. You can tell that I'm a filmmaker because I talk like this. Mm. Um, once upon a time, there was a little organization that has since lost its way, and that organization will remain un. Named, however, it was a foundation of some sort full of heretics. Can I ask a question? Of course you may. Is it Hilltown? No. <laughs> for the, Despite for the, my um... beautiful beard and amazing comb over, I am not a uh, Hillsong individual. <laughs> no, you guys don't seem either. It was just more the it's uh, coming to an end uh, and imploding. Anyway, go on, carry on. One of those, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> moving on from that. Sorry. So I guess, like, a little bit of background information on me. So I, I've been traditionally a lighting and camera person in the film industry for a while. However, my start was in 3D art and animation, working in visual effects and post-production. So I, um, I got recommended to come along to meet some people who were trying to do a really cool thing in a really cool space with some really cool people. And Mitch was one of those really cool people. So we put together for a particular... I'm going to be like deliberately vague, even though I don't need to, just because it's hilarious this way. 
So we got to put together a, a set of systems and work on a film for a particular Hollywood director. Um, and Mitch and I obviously bonded over the fact that we were both very much the same person, just a few years apart, and me maybe twice the size of him. <laughs> 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 so we, we bonded over the various trials and tribulations associated with trying to start something from the very beginning over a set of beers that we drank at the Rocks Brewing Company. Do the done-done thing now. Or do it in post, either way. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Thank you. The Hangman was the beer of choice. I'd say bring it back, but apparently that's what the old mate beer is. So thank you, you know it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, Mitch and I joined forces from there. Um, I guess we had many a discussion about the philosophy of film and why we enjoyed like, making things and kind of the philosophy behind making things because we're both very much tied up in the corporate machine of just making stuff for people. And some of it we care about and some of it we fucking don't. <laughs> and at a, at a risk of damaging my own career, there's a lot of just stuff being made. So... We uh, got thinking about what things need to be made and what stories need to be told, and that's where this idea of Old Mate came to fruition, entirely under Mitch's construction, but maybe partly realized, at least, with some visuals that I had dreamt up over the, the course of several thousand beers. <laughs> I like this. I don't know. Is that a good explanation? I feel like that was a really good story time. It really is. <laughs> That was excellent. I wanted more. I felt like that was a cliffhanger ending. I was like, is the episode over? Well, the next episode is after Old Mate comes out, and then, <laughs> then we'll see what happens from there. It's a serialized drama. Um, it's being written by, oh, fuck, what's his name? The guy who does the masterclass <clears throat> in writing. Uh, That's a couple of Wrote the West Wing. Help me out here. The joke oh, is funnier Zulkin. if I just oh, come up with it. Thank you. Uh, yes. Zulkin. So, Zulkin. so cut all that out. Yeah, it's a serialized drama. It's being written by Aaron Sorkin. Um, you'll see it on HBO in the next uh, 10 minutes. So lots of walk and talks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Endless walk and talks and dialogue so witty that no single human being could possibly come up with it, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Except for Aaron Sorkin. Yeah, nice. I don't know. It sounds to me like there's more questions in regards to this, uh, this first episode questioning of how shit happened. So is there anything mm. else that you want to know from me outside of how and me and God, how me and Mitch met? No, I'm interested in, um, in sort of uh, when, you, <clears throat> when you read the script, um, how you sort of obviously it's in conversation with Mitch, but come up with the sort of visual style of the film. Obviously, um, Mitch has lots of like little fucking drawings that he's done and has his conceptuals. <laughs> but um, what was what, what sort of process had you, did you go about? Like when we shot uh, the opening 10 minutes. Yeah, what informed you to make the choices that you did? Wow, this got much more official podcast than I was expecting. So I thank know, you. I'm just so like, I'm no, no, that's amazing. No, no, I'm really I happy. I learn lines and I bump into shit. Like, you guys... This is, <laughs> I'm this is, formally, the, this is I'm the shit formally, I was expecting. I'm going to formally petition that um, John takes it from here. I feel like... I feel like <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel you, like your, your John is the host. <laughs> John's got it down. Uh, so I guess we're going to preface this with one thing. First of all, as far as directors of photography go, I am the absolute worst at reading scripts. Just about every script I've ever read in my life, uh, I have read and thought to myself, well, that sounds like it might have been a good idea, but it isn't. <laughs> However, I know Mitch well enough, that, and he's convinced me well enough, that there's enough interesting shit going on behind the scenes to make this film work. So when I read the script, I went through it piece by piece, and part of my breakdown process is very much going through an individual sort of, uh, I guess you would say, my personal shot list versus Mitch's shot list. And a lot of the ways that we developed the look of the film together was Mitch had this, uh, I guess you would say, like graphic novel style um, storyboard list, mm -hmm. which was a lot of like very poignant moments that he was looking to hit. And for me, I think that the most important aspect of a cinematographer's career is to make things look as good as possible and to complete the day. So, <laughs> in some regards, that means occasionally compromising on the vision to make sure that we can actually get the amount of shots we need to get done, done in a day. So, after going through the script, me and Mitch had many, many conversations about how we want it to look. We talked about visual metaphor and um, visual references. 
basically just came together and found like where do we lie in regards to sort of a, a cohesive visual narrative, a, a, a cohesive visual language, I suppose. Um, there's a lot of David Fincher in there. There's a lot of like weird Hong Kong uh, crime drama stuff happening. And I think that it's all films are kind of informed by like three major factors, I think. You've got obviously the story, you've got the director's vision, and then you've also got the budgetary constraints and the time constraints. I'm going to link those two together because I didn't say four and I wanted to make it three things. That's <laughs> and it's better storytelling. <clears throat> so with the, with the resources available to us and with the vision that Mitch had and with the vision that I took from what Mitch had, we constructed kind of like um, a combined shot list. It was in part what Mitch has put together and in part what I had set aside as like, these are the moments to hit and here's where we can link things together and here's where we can keep things separate. It's a really boring answer, I know, just to be like, how did you come up with this? Well, we compromised a whole lot on a bunch <laughs> of different things until we found something that we both kind of agreed on and turns out when you kind of agree on something with another creative collaborator, you can make a beautiful thing. Filmmaking. Oh, wow. I think, <laughs> uh, I think from what I... The same way we're asking, asking Mason stuff, it's like, we, you know, for all the viewers out there, uh, you just see the final product and, it, and us as actors, we kind of, we're, we're, we're in there for the shoot schedule and then we're fucking, then we're gone to go drink beers on the beach somewhere. And um, no, I think it's interesting to hear the building blocks of like, how you get to that point where you fucking yell action. Yeah, I, like, I, first of all, I think that you discredit the craft that you guys are doing. I don't understand how actors function as human beings to, like, <laughs> Im immediately, like, detach yourself from your existing psyche and then put yourself in another one and be very convincing. <clears throat> it's one of those, like, if I didn't know the two of you better, I would say that you're both psychopaths because that's the majority of the interaction I've had with you. Maybe is... you don't know them well enough. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's the case. Maybe I need to be on more yarns. There's a, um... a, little, bit of, there's a little bit of something in everyone, so there's a little bit of psychopath in everyone, if you look hard enough. I think that's definitely the case. Yeah. But I guess in saying that too, <laughs> yeah, there, there is like a... Like, especially working with Mitch... And I guess working with myself, if any other aspiring directors are available for a very affordable rate, and by affordable I mean I hope you have a lot of money. Um, <laughs> the, the gimmick is kind of that we have a very, a very similar shared philosophy towards things. It comes down to even like, you know, we're afforded a great deal of resources because of my standing within, we'll say the industry, but it really just means that I have a job where I have a bunch of expensive equipment at my disposal. Um, we made the decisions based on the philosophy, not on the availability. Things like the camera we used, we were aiming for things like that. We'll get some, some horrible um, tech terms out of the way, but we were looking at a global shutter, and we were looking at a, um, a less dynamic range, more contrasty image, and things like that to harken back to sort of like a... I guess you would say a, a history of cinema angle. Um, the visual narrative and video production for years and years and years has sort of taken an interesting turn, whereas like the high-end productions have continued down the path of uh, more is better, and then a lot of the lower-end productions have leaned on character. We didn't want to lean on character. We didn't want to pretend like we had to find a, a particular vision to make the film feel visually cohesive. We thought that what we should do is instead lean on those old school filmmaking techniques and those old school filmmaking standards and try and make something that, I mean, it's yet to see how successful we've been, but make something that, that has um, some of that energy back in it and like inject some classic uh, filmmaking Hollywood vibes into a, into a project with just a bunch of random fuckwits in it, basically. <laughs> it, was also, it was also to emulate film to the extent that it feels like a physical, not a digital thing. And I think, I've, I, I still feel like there's a, um, 
for the audience, I feel like there's a difference. I feel like it feels like there were real human beings involved. You know, it was a real event that actually took place as opposed to all this digital shit that kind of feels a little sterilised as in it's too perfect. It kind of, it's losing the fingerprints maybe of the artist. The little mistakes that actually, like... A little bit like auto shit, etc. with music. Sorry, man. Ex thought... Exactly. Like, uh, Mason, you, you said when I was in Perth, you said when you're trying to... I mean, you play so many different people's music, right? When you're trying to emulate um, someone else's song to, to the extent when it's like a, like, a, like a Metallica, part of what makes their sound their sound is, like, their particularly shit instrument or that the fact that they're actually set, sort of out of tune or something. Yeah, like, there's mistakes I, that actually yeah, make did. it what it is. I remember you speak, we spoke about that. It was like, even with Jimi Hendrix, you go back and listen to a lot of, a lot of his old old recordings and stuff and you know maybe his guitar was ever so slightly not perfect or some of his bends might not be perfect but that was somehow the character the flavor the like another one is like the nature of like a lot of musicians like metallica just being rough as guts with their friends and that you know just having fun and it's not perfect mm -hmm. yeah. blink 182 is another example of this mm -hmm. when i was learning a few of their songs recently for a show and i went on to check out their live stuff and I don't know how often you guys have seen their live videos and I don't mean to, to speak bad to anyone that likes Blink-182 but it's like he's horribly out of tune like <laughs> even the guitar performance is sloppy but but this is the one thing I realized no one cared about that there was it no. was the way in which he was doing it. it was the way in which those lads are just up there doing it and even between their songs they're like you didn't tell me this song was going to be on the fucking set list, and he's just mm. like, I emailed it to you last night. Like, there was yeah. there's more to it than the perfection. There was, it's like a depth to it that happens within the sound. And I guess, you know, Mitch, you and I spoke about this with even the sound of Old Mate uh, in the music and in the sound as well. But even in the ways which I was recording, a lot of it was like, some of the stuff you hear so far is like only the first take roughest guts like <clears throat> options that weren't perfect that were really loose and are on the edge of being so wrong um mm. but are just somehow so perfectly right are you talking because about recording 57 right. <laughs> <laughs> you had to, you had to so, be there jordan so Sorry, many of, yeah there's Can't so many <laughs> um it's i think a lot of it's just in the like yeah, at least that's what I, what we, Mitch and I discussed when it came to a lot of the sound. Of how could it sound like a lot of that old stuff that didn't sound so digital, that felt real and physical, like you're saying, Mitch, like you're there, even in the way in which you're hearing it and the, and, and the breaths and all that kind of stuff and it needs to be raw, it needs to be in your face, it needs to be like, yeah. yeah. I think, I think at the risk of offending punk fans everywhere, because punk fans are the type to be offended, sorry, I'm one, I understand what the situation is, is that kind of punk rock attitude of understanding that the emotion behind something is almost more important than the end product itself, right? And that's kind of what we're all trying to do. And I think for a big part, it sounds to me like that's a, a part of what we've all been doing in our creative endeavors since day dot, and why I think that, at least for me, I've been excited about this project in particular because it's a chance for me to like, like, look, let's be real for a second. If you look at my reel, you look at the stuff I make, action-packed, whatever, um, <laughs> guns akimbo, fucking blood <clears throat> busters sort of filmmaking is not my thing. However, the, the mentality of taking something and just letting it be raw and be like, this is how it is and whether it is real or it's not or what you take of it, this is the, the message we're trying to get across and this is the story we're trying to tell. I think that speaks to people more than some manufactured bullshit. Absolutely. Sure, man. Well said. Uh, uh, hey, one even... caveat. Oh, go on, go on, go on. No, you go, you go. No, 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 please. <laughs> no, please, go on. No, come on, John. <laughs> Fine. I think the fact that, that being a human being is imperfection, we want to recognize imperfection in art because it's a reflection of us, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's what art should be. Like, we live in a time where, like, you look at, I don't know what, I don't want to get into the whole AI generated art thing, right? But, like, Holy you shit. look at a, yeah, you look at a, a period of history where, like, art is becoming less about the human experience. Like, now it is no longer art is the mm. one thing that can separate us from the homogeny. 
um, mm. because it can be made by computer. Like it can be an algorithm. The 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 individual message is kind of the most important part of this mm-hmm. whole situation now. Like previously, I would have told you that it was all about corporations. It was all about like decision by committee. You know, you add enough people, you remove the soul from something. Mm-hmm. Now it goes further than that. Now it's like you remove the soul from it because there's literally no fucking human beings attached. Mm-hmm. To it. There's yeah. no like individual thought that's gone into it. Mm-hmm. So now more than ever, it's kind of a time for us to like. I don't, I don't want to say rise up because that has very obvious <laughs> connotations, but there's, a, there's an opportunity for us all to like try mm-hmm. and make something, try and like push an agenda, you know, be like, let's like, whatever you make of this piece, this is us. This is what we've put into it. And this is how we feel about what we're doing. Mm-hmm. We had the, we had a similar conversation. I think it was at one about the return to meaning about things coming back to like, we are, we have the, uh, the, we coined the movement, the Neo Pomo. Which are still t-shirts. I didn't think this was going to come back, but they are still t-shirts that we have made. Um, about, you know, neo-postmodernism, about what comes post-modern. Um, and about, yeah, when we're in this age of AI, like, what the, what the bloody hell? Like, it looks good, so what? You know, it's like, it's the, it's the meaning underneath. Hmm. It's a human connection, fundamentally. You want to be able to feel like, a, like a, a human story behind behind what's happening it's like when you go to to like an arts and craft fair or, or whatnot and you find like a hand carved spoon that's got like mm-hmm. imperfections and you can almost like visualize like how that person made that spoon as opposed to going to the shop and having like a, mach- a machine fucking one done that it's just like this exactly spoon and there's just nothing to it but you cannot see the sort of story or like you know, I, you know I know going down to Salamanca markets in Tassie like having like wood crafting stalls is huge mm-hmm. with every little piece you can see like the effort that's gone into it and, but you only see the effort that's gone into it through the, the minor imperfections mm-hmm. or when there are where there is perfection I mean it's like yeah you, yeah it's you can see like the the, the handwork in it because the, it, it can't be perfect I guess like what we're saying ultimately is the pursuit of perfection is uh, an endless game. And yeah. like ultimately I think the thing that connects with people is not perfection. Like you look at, mm-hmm. I mean, it's the most hipster thing ever, right? But you look at people who are into vinyl or into fucking VHS tapes or whatever now. They're looking mm-hmm. for like a nostalgic connection to something, something that connects them emotionally. People lean on, I mean, I just said the word, but nostalgia yeah a lot to try and drive a a sense of of connection. But I think that ultimately there's lots of ways we can connect to to a piece of media or to to a physical thing. And I think it is what you're talking about, John. It is very much like understanding when you look at something that there was like a human being had a part in making this thing. Mm -hmm. And like you can understand that ultimately there's a there's another person with a life and experience as rich as your own who has created a thing and now you get to experience that thing and then in in turn take on some of their experience or some of their life into your own by a, a piece of media or by a thing that's been created mm. well said. i like that very much so very well said I've got that a lot. I've got a put it on the instagram for, i've got a question for jordan um now that you know, in the spirit of what John was doing before, do you have any questions for us to better further jump back and jump into the whole thing? Questions for you guys. Well, that's a difficult thing. So, first of all, I guess we should uh, address the elephant in the room. Mason, I've never fucking spoken to you before in my life. No. I'm Mason <laughs> uh, it's, I've heard your name a few times in passing. It's nice to finally be here. If you uh, joined the conversation, like, more than three minutes into the actual recording, then I think we would have had an introductory moment. But I just wanted to say, hello, Mason. It's nice hello, to meet you, mate. Hello, Jordan. Nice to meet you, too. <laughs> Tell me a bit about yourself. So you've produced the music and you're working on the sound and bits and pieces on the project. First of all, how, I mean, I'm sure this has probably been addressed. How did you meet Mitch? What's your, uh, your interest in the project? This is probably really boring podcasting because it's just become, sorry, yawning. yawning. It just becomes a matter of uh, me <laughs> catching up on all the shit that I probably should have watched the other episodes you know, about. I was going to say you would know the answer to these questions if you watched episode one and two. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I'm so I think, sorry. I think the story is very much the same as everybody else's. We, and, and very much the same as how you and Mitch met. 
it's always on another project on something else and that and that has a different light has perhaps not something that you can connect to or has other reasons why you're there you know it could be for working for somebody or doing something and you're you're both there to to craft something else and you end up finding <coughs> that you would rather work with each other on something else um or you just become friendly you become to likable and you become you find that you're like oh i would actually really want to work with you on more things and then as you either finish that project or you know move on from it Mitch and I were the same we just were trying to find something to kind of work on and a lot of ours was uh, um, rather than thousands of beers it was you know a little bit of fun long long lots of zoom chats online with some you know jazz herb all tea herbal tea you know that kind of thing <laughs> cut that out and post right Mitch but, uh, <laughs> Um, Leave it in. And then, um, you know, just trying to find something. And then Mitch, you know, about, I don't know how long ago it was, but we had a bunch of little projects we were doing, and this one stumbled across. And since version one all the way till now, it's been like kind of exactly what you just said. Really an exciting, like I'm, I'm waiting for it. I'm looking forward to it. It's been like the beginning of our, it's really all of our beginning friendships with Mitch. Um, but like it's kind of like a, when you discuss with others about collaborating and doing something and now we're in the process here of doing it and that's just exciting to me it's really exciting because on all the other jobs they could be really fun they could be really exciting they could be on such a high level but even when you're in there you're just like you know it's not my baby it's not my, my full input it's I'm just experiencing this um, whereas we're here all collaborating and creating something that we all want to do, and I think that's really exciting. So that's kind of like my different alternate version of how I met Mitch. I think alternate version is right because I think that like we do share a very similar experience. But it's been a it's been a wild ride for me, uh, and I think it's been a slightly different experience for me too. Because Mitch and I worked a lot on this in pre production and then in production itself, right? Like mm. there was a there was a lot of work that went into it before the picture and then during the picture itself. However, you guys have continued to work on it after the fact. And well, I think yeah, that, like, in a like... big part that... Sorry, you go ahead, Mitch. Mm -hmm. No, I was just going to say, we started writing the music in 2017. Yeah, that was okay. a change. On that was versions the change. of the script that were not anything like this. It was a okay. different movie altogether. And then, I guess, the only part of production that you weren't really involved in, Mason, was actually production, although the music yeah. was there. And then... Um, and then picked it up in a big way in post. Um, yeah. So the nature of the actual pre-production is kind of similar, I would say. There you go. Yeah. And it's uh, funny, well, let like, me rephrase that then. <laughs> I guess that like uh, my primary contribution to this entire thing has been production. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to renege everything I said for the sake of visual it cohesion. Was, no, no, no. It wasn't, it wasn't far off. Yeah, and even, um, like, even post for me, I'm, I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of post because I asked John and, and Dean this last week of kind of like, I only come in at the end a lot of the time on some projects. I haven't lived the years that some of the people have done. I haven't lived the days of the shoots. And a lot of, like, my pursuit of a different world of composition was trying to find something that's a little bit, I don't know, I could be a part of it more. And so when pre-production, the idea of doing that, um, and even the further discussions Mitch and I have about me being in production, like actually walking on the set and being able to get out of the depths of this cave that I live in where I rustle my thoughts around and then 25 minutes later press something and eventually come out with some noise um, I want to see how you guys do your thing um, and how instead of me just watching just the sort of minute cut of it is seeing how you're doing it and, and I think that would better help me to see how I can add more I don't know like you know in the situation of the joke duh, no, you know that's an example of me thinking what would it be like if, if music was there for you beforehand for all of you to hear for, mm. all, for that to be a you know and the same with kind of like what you said before John about you know your version of this is that you come onto the set and then afterwards you're you're off drinking beers like that's that's like usually where I start um, and we never get this crossover and it's a, you know it's and also when you see credits in movies it's like you see the people at the beginning and then you just see this plethora of other people and you ask the question how many of these people have actually met each other um, and worked with each other? And so that's one big awesome way of saying, hello, Jordan, nice to meet you in pre-post. 
and production, I guess, you know. And Amazing. It's lovely to meet you too. <laughs> the other two as well. Um, and that, that's, I guess, what a lot of our previous conversation sort of was on last week is um, is the kind of, right now we're technically all in pre-production discussing about a film we haven't even done yet. And I think that's beautiful in itself, you know, that we can all see that from the beginning. And then we will all see this again. Episode 396... Uh, you know, look back on this and be like, fucking whoa. You know, that's, this has been one hell of a ride. More than just our portion of pre, post, or production. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was beautiful. I think that that's like, that's a really interesting perspective to take because <clears throat> I think that like, even for me, like, I feel like I, I've been a part of this process the whole way through and I've really enjoyed the being a part of the process the whole way through. But there is also a death of ego that takes place in this where I have to let go of the footage I've taken and be like, this goes on to live another life in post-production. You know, like, Mm. this was one of those projects where because of the way that it is and because of the way that I can... I can afford time to it or not afford time to it or as a a bigger point, it, it is a matter of of taking something that I, I feel like I worked really hard to achieve and also allow that to flourish under the work of others. And I think that like it's really nice to meet the others who are working on that, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. Mm. And that's, you know, it is a way <laughs> to meet you now and realize that I've technically been staring at your sort of view of things for a long time. You know, I hope it's been a good view of things. It, it has been. In the edit of it, it's been, you know. And it's just, it's weird to sort of, I'm not necessarily weird to say put a face to it, but it would be no different than the same to you, that you're seeing the others, the face to it. And obviously, you know, John and Dean, you are the face to it. Um, but for you to see, you know, also the hidden side of it that kind of makes you two something else, you know, that's, mm. this is just a Makes you two thing. look like Jordan right now. <laughs> I, uh, I mimicked one of the lighting setups we did for uh, one of the projects to try and like I don't know tie in cohesively. The idea being that you yes. can cut me into the film if you need to right now. I've recorded a, a small segment. <laughs> so, uh, you are Mr. Mullock. If we never get there, I feel like do the Mr. Mullock lines. I feel like I'm sorry. Say that again. Can, I feel like if we can, every creative should have some little cameo, even if it's just like a. Like a passing shot of like a, you know. I would love it that, yeah. (laughs) Well, I want to agree with you. I think the joke is that I appear beautifully in this one thing and then I never appear again. Yeah, but that's what I would like. I could picture a scene where something happens and it just cuts to Jordan as he is right now after a scene going. He could be the forklift driver. (laughs) (laughs) In the film, in the film, like this, this horrible fight sequence takes place. Hard cut to me. Now you see the creative ambition behind this piece was. (laughs) Um, to try and frame it in a very like Kurosawa way, you know, like imbue the realism into it in a in a. I, I can't go on. <laughs> and halfway through much. the sentence, it just comes back. Or yeah, if you, just, if you just pop up, this is a public service announcement. Mitch refused to take my advice on this scene. I don't condone anything that's yeah. going to happen for the next <laughs> ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but but the same thing. But the same thing with the West of Post as well. It's like it cuts to me too, and it's just kind of like. <laughs> so we had an issue with this scene in the music, and it's just like <laughs> other other story, and then. And the funny thing is, every time John and Dean want to say something, <laughs> we just cut. Like, because it's just the nature of the whole stupidity of it. That could be, this could be the version of Old Mate that is seen um, in the extended extended version that is on Old Mate Yarns. You did have the. Go on, I want to, I want two shots. I want it to be like a scene that's really dark and mucky and like and no one's well well lit, but there's like a little bit of a crowd, and then we do something big. And then it's a, a reaction shot of Jordan just going, <gasps> but he's just absolutely immaculately lit. And then we go straight back into like a really dark, gritty look. Hang on, let and me the, give you that right now. Ready? And the, yeah. Oh, yeah. There we go. That's the one. And the second, the second shot is some, something big happening. And then it's like a quick pan to Mason sitting at a, at a piano like this going, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, also That's perfect. As well. Yes. <laughs> oh, product placement. Duh, duh. Oh, I gotta look right into the barrel of the camera. 
Yeah, it sounds a bit Jaws. Do, do it one more time. Do it one more time, but don't say it with your voice. Oh, <laughs> the timing was immaculate. You've it's better to, this you've way. You've got to direct me, your door. That is a bit Jaws, <laughs> isn't it? And action. I was so. <laughs> Damn it, Dino! You broke the code. So Mitch and I spoke about the simplicity of Jaws back in the day, and that the idea of like how much that semi time. It's you know, and also in the nature of production didn't have the shark ready everything was going wrong mm. you know and that they were like how are we gonna do this and they're kind of like let's edit it so there is no shark you know or, so or at least from the perspective mm. of we don't have it and then john williams comes along and goes like, you know i'm i'm really saying this in the wrong way but like I'm, i'll be the shark you know yeah. um or at least i the idea of the shark existed within the music um and then we kind of went off but then we, we did start with that, but we also spoke about the nature of the two notes being like a heartbeat. Yes. Um, like, boom, boom. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's really where... Uh, Jaws was definitely the inspiration for the, like, the symbolism of it and the, mm -hmm. and the, the simplicity of it. But uh, cool. a lot of it, that's really, cool. when we were talking about the kick drum, because a lot of this... Dun, dun, the note choice came after the rhythm. The rhythm mm -hmm. was... A lot of the first things were the kick drums. Remember, Mitch, the mm. boom, mm -hmm. boom, with just the kick mm. drums, no melody choice just like a heartbeat like no pitch yeah and then essentially once the grittiness of the bass and the and i i, I it's still a funny story to me you know the, the track starving the one you're just hearing there was me just like not having anything ready f to show mitch after we've been trying to write this main idea for so long and so many ideas and idea and and i just was like ah and then 15 minutes was just this loose burr, burr, like all tension notes based around that beat, mm. and that was the simplicity of it. Um, and that was just heart, like heartbeat. And, but, mm -hmm. yeah, a big old ode to John Williams. Great, man. Well, I think that, like, the, the heart of creativity really is in that spontaneity. Like, we talked previously about how Mitch and I had, like, put together a full shot list of, like, how we wanted the picture to look, and Mitch had, like, mm -hmm. this immaculate document that was like, here is every frame of the picture that's going to happen. And then ultimately, when when the metal when the rubber eats the road, I don't know what the fucking saying is. When we started going, <laughs> it was just like, cool, let's figure out something that looks good or something that sounds good or something mm. that resonates with us. And I think mm. that's exactly what you've done there, right? Yeah, you strip yeah. away all the like the, the the directions of perfection, and and you just kind of like mm, simple, like what I are we the philosophy to say? of good enough. <laughs> philosophy of fuck it. Um, which, I yeah, have which is... used this analogy since yeah, yeah. 2017 with you, Mason, and it's Picasso's yeah. bull. Are you yes, guys you familiar have. with That's Picasso's so bull? You're going to have to fill me in. I'm going right, to pretend to be the guy I who doesn't know. Bring it up on the screen Just today. as you find that, Mitch, you mentioned, you know, fuck it. That was also mm. part of the heartbeat. I remember we were trying to, we gave so much, we were trying to dig so deep what? into the, the theme yeah. behind it, and it was like, da, 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 fuck it. Like, it's and that I... quick. I, I was actually, uh, before the Picasso's Bull um, saga, I did actually have a note on that, which was, I think the fact that you wrote it in 20 minutes was perfect for that particular song, um, because to me, that sound, and yes, like the heartbeat, but it's, it's not just a heartbeat, it, it's a raise in heartbeat, yeah, that's Savage coming out. Yeah, so he's Kit, he's held his calm, he's cool the entire time, and every time that plays, it's him just... Fucking going, no, fucking stay down. So what you're trying to say is not... every time I need to write something Kit Savage, I just have to be stressing the fuck out. Um, <laughs> just yeah, yeah, yeah. just, just like, just be... like, you need to be whipping at me gunpoint. And I'm like, ah, ah, all right. You, <laughs> da, da, da. Yeah, so Mitch brought this. This was one of the first ideas is when I used to bring Mitch ideas and they were so fully fledged and thick and full of crazy layers and look at me, look what I can do, Mitch. And Mitch would come back with that, this exact thing. And you can explain it from here. Can everyone this. see Picasso's bull? I can see Picasso's yes. bull. So, I'm just going to plug in my mouse because it is dying. So Picasso was before, well, in his own words, he said, it took me years to draw like an artist, but a lifetime to look like a child on drugs. <laughs> and... <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> um, all right, fixed it. 
Yeah, and he was actually also a phenomenal um, kind of, I suppose, naturalesque painter as well. Like, like he was uh, his early career was quite um, trying to replicate the real as opposed to do what Picasso then did, which was absolutely batshit insane. Um, which, by today's standards, is just neo pomo. Um, but back then, was uh, was something else. And so basically, he went from trying to take a photorealistic, well, not photorealistic, but true to life drawing of a bull and go, how much can I strip this down while still maintaining the essence of what it is so that anyone can look at it and mm -hmm. know exactly what it is? And I suppose that, I guess, was, that was pretty true to his whole career, yeah? Yeah, well, I was going to say that I think that Picasso's career, and excuse the, I'm going to say that again if you want to edit it. I suppose that Picasso's career could be defined as a mastery of one's craft and then a mastery of the visual medium itself. The mm. idea being that you need to know your tools and know what you're trying to create before you can truly experience creativity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like like and mm. a lot of that was exactly what I felt like in this piece was I was trying to throw all the tools at it, but I at the, at the origins of it was not looking at at what I was really trying to create. I was just trying to use all the tools I had until it was under the pressure and the nature of just like, you know, ah, fuck it. And then out of that, you know, that's, yeah. I think, uh, well, that's the you... overarching philosophy of the film. It's <laughs> like, we all have access to ourselves. A We're all professionals. We've all done this for many, many years and honed our craft. And this is an experience for us to be like, Ah, oh, fuck it. Like, I'm just going to fucking do it. Like, yeah. there's no point in me applying more method to it. It's more important for me just to create the thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's I think funny too, from when... an... Go on. Oh, sorry, what were you going to say? No, 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 please. I was just going to say, it's funny from an, from an acting perspective that ties into everything that we've been talking about of, like, spontaneity. Spontaneity? Spontaneity. And, um... yeah, it sounded better, spontaneity. 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 No. Yeah, but, uh... <laughs> One thing, you know, I remember just learning, it's just like, learn everything you need to do, you need to do that. throw the book away, throw your rehearsal script away, and um, basically of meaning of like, going through your script, where is it? I literally threw it away last week. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but going through your script, going line by line, what does that line mean? What are you saying to them? What actions are you putting on? What are you trying to do? What are your objectives? What are your fucking super mm -hmm. objectives? Mm -hmm. All this kind of thing. And learning it, and you've got all these little moments and everything that you want to try and do. And, you know, you might be in rehearsal process and doing those, but at a certain point, you've just got to throw all those away and trust that all that work is in here, and that's when you can sort of truly be spontaneous with it. And I guess, you know, yeah. Mitch talking about um, always using the takes that are, that are our versions of it, whether it's a script or not. Obviously, there's a lot of work that, us, that we do as actors where we you need to be word perfect, and that's a whole other kettle of fish. But um, when you have these moments of spontaneity, because you feel like you know the character well, and you know how the whole cohesiveness of, of everything is when you can really start to play. So it's mm -hmm. yeah, it feeds into that feeling of, of uh, all right, I know exactly what I'm doing with this, I know exactly what everyone else is, like what's going on, now I can just fuck around and just whatever comes out, comes out. Yeah, that's like the tools, it's kind of like you're explaining the character as we would explain our tools. Mm. Like you want to be able to know your character so well, then with that you can then create, rather than just, mm. you know, just, yeah, at the beginning of it all, just guessing. Yeah. I'm sorry to harp on about philosophy, but I think this is why it, it helps because this is underpinning all of it. If you understand the why, everything you do after that is correct. Yeah. So when essentially this, this simplest drawing and finding the essence of the song or the character or the shot, if you take all the shots and you boil it down, if you take all the script and you boil it down, if you take all the music and boil it down, what you're essentially left with is like, why did you make the choices you made? And if you get the why up front, so I've always approach this with philosophy, if you know where it starts, it doesn't matter what you do, I can actually give you now complete uh, authority to just do what you do best and I know that it's going to be in the right direction but better than I could have imagined it. So I will give you um, the, <laughs> the little stick ball and then any detail you put on top of that will still look like a ball. Mm. Would it be I... funny if we brought a bull on set? 
<laughs> We've got one. Yeah. John. Hey. Old, old directing teacher at, uh, at night at Giel, um, talking about directors. And uh, is it they're not, they're not, it's not called someone who, like, a telly what to do it. It's a director. They, <laughs> well, but, I don't know. I can't remember if he's, he said something much more eloquent than, than myself. Like but, like but just the, the basic idea of, like, a director shows you the direction and just it's more less of telling people what to do and more of just like nudging them in the right direction and letting them get there themselves type thing i'm such yeah. a big proponent i was very um fortunate to have um <coughs> uh, a mentor um gene shout out to gene he is uh i won't say this sorry. um he is a, a leadership um consultant for large companies and he will go in and kind of coach CEOs how to <clears throat> CEO how to lead and um, he taught me this concept of servant leadership which is the most critical thing that you can do is get the right people around you point them in the right direction make sure they know where they're going make, get them to explain it back to you get them to know it better than you do the goal that we all share and then lead from the back let them go like, you guys know where you're going. I don't need to be at the front. I just need to get you what you need to get there. Um, and any any other way, I think, is just going to be an uphill battle the entire time. I think it brings up an interesting question, which, like, based on what John's saying and then talking about the concept of, you put it so eloquently, Mitch, I feel like I'm going to butcher it, of servant leadership, it really brings up the question of, and this is an interesting perspective to take, by the fact that this film was both written and directed by you, Mitch, who makes the film? Is it the Everyone. script writer or is it the... Everyone. That's a great, great answer, but I want to dive into this deeper. Is it the script writer? Is it the director? Who is the primary creative voice? Because as a director of photography and, like, and as a gaffer myself as well, right, I see creative input as a hierarchy, but a hierarchy mm. that builds on each other. The director of photography uh, puts forward the vision that the director has, whether it's specifically like the shots that he wants or it's the way that he wants the story to be told. <clears throat> the gaffer creates the lighting to match the, the aesthetic that the director of photography wants to make. But the director and screenwriter, that's the really interesting dynamic there. It's like, where does the picture come from? We talk about uh, Picasso's bull. Mm. I would say that the screenwriter creates the bull and the director and the actors are the people who take it from there. When the bull has more detail, it's all part of the bull. Like, there are so many similarities between a film crew and an army and, you know, the general and the person on the, on the, on the ground and everyone in between are responsible pretty much for that army does because they're all a part of it and so I feel like you know whoever makes the first decision and whoever makes the last decision they're all informing it and yes to different amounts and to different extents um, but I would say you know like on some films the DP is basically a glorified cameraman and in some cases they choose a particular shot that actually tells a part of the story that wasn't written in the script. Like, um, for example, Roger Deakins on No Country for Old Men, where he wanted this massive long tracking shot that comes up from the ground and then ends, and you see this big sweeping landscape, and then ends with feet dangling, and then it goes up and there's a man mm -hmm. hanging from a tree. And they were, they were not going to shoot it like that. They were going to show the guy from the start. And that's a way of telling the story that the director and the screenwriter didn't... Um, think of or, or you know that that's a part of the story um and so I, I would i would honestly just have to say and also for the ethos of the film that we're making that i think every single person and every fingerprint they put on it makes it exactly what it is and sure someone could make a shorter decision that makes more of a difference aka me versus you know the person applying you know graffiti on the pit which I want everyone to tag I would love if everyone's fucking graffiti is on that like literally every cast and crew member has a graffiti tag on some part of the set I think that would be fucking awesome um, maybe there's some cases where they're so 
authoritarian that some people literally do not have a say. But I, would, I, I couldn't back away from the point that I think every single person involved makes the movie what it is. I think I'm going to graffiti the bull. <laughs> oh, oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. The perfect representation of the bull. Very small, in the corner too. And, and Jordan, you've only got to get it in like one portion of the frame really quickly too. And then, <laughs> and then it cuts to like John and Dino like looking at it really briefly, just subtly throughout the film to be like, this is the underlying ethos of this entire thing. Mason, what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to sharpen up the shutter halfway through a, a whip pan and just like vaguely, like for one frame, we'll catch the ball and know that it's signed by Mason at the bottom. I think, Mitch, I think, Mitch, what you're talking about is creative buy-in, right? The idea that somebody can come on board. And you think about this in terms of like down to the, the makeup artist, the, the set decorator, the, the PA who... You know, suggests randomly that like, oh, maybe instead of uh, a takeaway coffee, they would have a keep cup because that's what the character would want, <laughs> right? You're talking about like a, a general conceit gets made, and that's part of the screenwriter director process. But then past that, it's kind of, and this is the beautiful thing about film, and it's what makes film like a collaborative art as opposed to a high art. It, it is that everybody comes on board and brings in their own ideas, thus enhancing the experience. I don't think that that takes away from any individual's contribution. I don't think that's what you're saying either. But I just, I guess I want to touch on the point that, like, I think there is still a voice at the very top of it, I but that so. voice is served by the voices under it. Mm-hmm. Mm, I think that's great. Also, just on a random side note, about five minutes ago, both John and Dean either instinctively... Both went and scratched themselves like this and simultaneously both put their hands down at the same time. Now, I don't know if they were being directed. I don't know if they were both acting. But, Mitch, go back five minutes and you'll watch how uncannily without... I don't know if the two of you, like, signaled or texted each other. But I remember just, like, listening to Jordan and Mitch speak and just see this, like... Now you're uh, working for the Navy. You're getting very... Yeah, no, suspicious unlike you kind of which is the detail that I think led you there in the first place it's the crystalline silica <laughs> <laughs> we just did it again we did. No. they're communicating something Mason don't no. tell them three of you oh three of you guys oh, drank man. three of you guys drank your porno named beers at the same time earlier too <laughs> oh. oh terrifying um, <laughs> yes uh I was going to say, yeah, I, I mean, I, yeah, there is an ultimate power that falls in the editor's hands as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's that's the third <laughs> part of the process I've totally neglected to mention. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I uh, think you're right in saying that. Like, there's a the theory, case, right? The theory of present, so. ah, and that's the thing. We're kind of living in a, a world where the theory of the three films is uh, entirely played out by one person's <laughs> ultimate creative decision, right? Yeah. The idea that a film exists in the theoretical in pre-production, in the practical during production, and then in the final result during post-production. Mm. I don't know who the hell came up with that. It would sound really smart if I could tell you about the theory of three films right now. I've, I've never heard it as the theory you of three films. Did. I've always heard it as there's three scripts. There's the I've one you write, the one you it. shoot, and the one you edit. <laughs> exactly, yeah. That. That's it, yeah. I'm learned. My initial oh, okay. Googling resulted in an article to, called Towards a Critical Theory of Third World Films, which I don't want to read. That sounds That's really depressing. That's not quite what uh, we're looking for. I was yeah, going to say like it's just that uh, Who Killed Captain Alex film from somewhere yeah. in Nigeria. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was going to say earlier when you were talking about compromise, Jordan, for anyone that's a filmmaker or you know, a wannabe filmmaker that's watching, I, don't, I think... It, Observing from an actor's perspective, knowing on small independent films, knowing the producers or knowing the creatives, the compromise is, regardless of budget, whether it's like a shoestring budget, like no budget, to like, I don't know, 10 million or above, you're going to come across compromise no matter what. So don't hold on too tightly mm -hmm. to some precise yeah, vision. And sometimes you need to deal with the... the it might be a foggy day and you might need to completely change your shot based on the weather or something might that's, fall a location, might fall I think that's a very... Like, uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, and I think that's a very salient point. Like, uh, you know, I, I've personally worked on things from, you know, uh, 
short film where I'm making two hundred dollars a day that never got released because nobody cares about it. Up to like you know working on a PayPal commercial where there's disgusting amounts of money being thrown left, right, and center. In all scenarios, I think that like ultimately the job of the filmmaker is to get it done. You know, like we all have. Uh, in we, there, there is a vision for the end of the film, and it's important to get through it. I think the, there's a British director by the name of Ed Moore who has a, a brilliant podcast called Ta- Tail Slate. It's only got like six episodes, but they are some of the best insights into cinematography you can find in the industry. Yeah, well, mm-hmm. That's an amazing plug. Enjoy that. Ed Moore says to himself, <laughs> like the job of the DP is to make it pretty, but ultimately to get to make the day. You know, like ultimately, and he, you know, he shot Doctor Who, he shot um, Red Dwarf. He's a TV oh, director so he's of making photography. Days. He is yeah, making days. The, and like his work is good, and he gets paid. Well. Yes, <laughs> big claps to Ed Moore and to Benedict Spence, his co-host, who also does beautiful, beautiful work. I follow both of them on Instagram. Highly suggest you check them out. The lighting but, is crazy for such fast turnaround shoots. And that's the thing. It, it's and that's. Post production, pre production, that's everything. That's that's all all the production together. Like on a on a shoot like uh, we're getting a bit off the scope of what we're talking about right now, but on a shoot like that, the the aim of the game is to try and push as many things towards pre production as you possibly can. If you can have someone come into the shoot and you've given them a theoretical idea of how you want to do something, mm-hmm. and they can execute on that before you arrive, that means you make four more shots in that day, and the, sh- and the film yeah. is. Four shots better because of it. And I think that, like, ultimately, we're talking about compromise here. Compromise when you start your creative career feels like the death of creativity. It feels like mm. you, are, you are, instead of realizing your creative goals, you are compromising. You are, are, are moving away from that to meet some kind of practical solution. But I think that in filmmaking in particular, and realistically in all art forms, you'll find that the people who succeed are the people who embrace compromise, the people who look at something as being like, man, that's what we got, and that was good. It's better to have a film that is imperfect than to not have a film at all. Absolutely. And as the great Roger Deakins said, well, I guess uh, that's a terrible way to put it. There's a great Roger Deakins anecdote, we'll say that, where he talks about a film critic who came to him one day and said, man, Blade Runner, 2049, I really enjoyed this, this one shot. I thought it really stood out to me, and it, it really spoke to me in a very meaningful way. And Roger Deakins is everyone's favorite DP, or at least every DP's favorite DP, myself included. And Roger said to himself, I think I failed. Mm. And he said that I think I failed because that means that that one shot stood out to you. I would rather the whole film be a cohesive narrative that services a story and that, that pushes a narrative forward than for any individual piece to be a beautiful piece of motion picture. Mm. And I think that's, that's ultimately at the heart of compromise. The compromise is I just need to make everything good enough, good enough to serve the story and good enough to, to move things forward. Not every shot can be something I want to put on my fucking show reel to show nobody who ever watches those things. <laughs> mm. Sometimes it's just about like, Getting the thing so that the thing can move forward. Saying, Fuck. hey, was that take good? Fuck it. It's good enough. Uh, yeah. uh, I love that the philosophy like of fuckets really making is. into this. <clears throat> we, um, we actually spoke about this on episode two with just uh, Dean and John. But Mason, I mentioned your, and I credited you for it, mentioned your, um, speaking of compromises and restrictions, um, uh, coming away from infinity. And when I would give you two words... I love that. that. I, I genuinely love that because otherwise mm. I have so many options. I otherwise you just float options. off into space. And that compromise really came into the idea of like, well, you have this and this. And I used to, a lot of my philosophy back in the day of the recording as well was, I, and I lost that for a bit and then I had to relearn it again, was I only have two microphones, you know? So then what? how could I work to get the best out of those two microphones? And I... I, I Frequently, and I don't mean this in a, in a weird way, but it's like a way of me reliving my path to how I've gotten here. We'll go back and listen to something I've done a decade ago and look at something in it that, you know, sometimes I've, I don't have today, which was this nature of, and it teaches me to redo it, I guess, is nature of just guessing and this nature of just trying. And, and I had two mics 
let's get the best out of just those two. Mm -hmm. And there's a philosophy nowadays where in a studio environment, especially when it's contained, put 17 mics on it, man. <laughs> you know, why not if you've got them? And then I, I did that for a bit. And, you know, that really annoyed me. And there was one recording session where I did put 17 mics. And we only used two. And that's recording a drum kit. Yeah. A lot of different sounds. And only two were used. And that blew my mind. It was a recording session I had a couple of years back. And it made me realize again, don't go in with all of the options. Restrict yourself from the get-go and work with that. And that restriction, by the way, is the essence of the film. So if the film needs a lot of stuff, bring in a lot of stuff. But mm. then, but then, like, you know, if it's, a, if it's a documentary where you need to go capture the most crystalline visual of Antarctica, wicked, but only bring that one camera or only bring that one lens or, you know, and, and restrict it and then work with that, nail that. Mm. And I think if you do that, uh, at least in my, my personal experience, you enjoy it because you learn something you otherwise wouldn't have. Because you had all the options, you had all the choices, and mm. you, you could only make these choices if you went down this path, and you wouldn't have made these choices unless you restricted yourself. And Mitch, you and I have said about that in the past. You know, on some of the projects we've done where we've literally spent months coming up with an idea, and, it just, and we just never wouldn't have gotten to that conclusion unless we made all the errors unless we went to so many wrong directions um, and that's what led us to the, the actual direction which is fundamentally the found. practical example of us realising Picasso's bull which was you threw everything at this track yeah. and then we took it away one instrument at a time and then yeah. got down to its bare bones and, I, and I, I realised this today I was working on this advertising job that's up to script revision, so I've edited a, a two-minute um, or minute and a half uh, television commercial for an American company, and uh, we're up to s script, which means edit, um, 25. Usually oh. there's three, maybe four rounds of revisions in edit, and that's the script is usually locked, and there's three rounds of revisions. This is script, nothing I've done, the entire story has changed 25 times. Um, it's insane. And they're trying to pixel fuck me on the timing of things. Just, you know, oh, that, this super needs to be a little bit longer. And it's like, I had to put my foot down today. And I was like, this is a, <laughs> these guys are a fairly large American agency. And I was like, guys, <laughs> I, I, I can't be fucking with, like, mil microseconds if the entire minute and a half keeps changing. Like, let's, let's deal with big block first and then get to the detail. And it's Picasso's bull. It's like, don't pixel fuck the hair on the bull when you're about to change its bones. Like, you know, you've got its head on its ass. Mm. Don't tell me that its dick isn't long enough. Like, come on. <laughs> I think we're, we're talking about a couple of things here, but I think that something that we can take away from this really is the value of scarcity, right? The value of scarcity and minimalism. Looking at something as being like, something that's inherently valuable because there's less of it. You look at like options, options are the death of creativity. And yes, that's, exactly. That's the, that's AI. the thing. Going that's to the, the AI thing, thing is like, this, so the AI can do whatever you want, all the options. But that one realistic painter or artist, they only have the craft skills they've got. And so that that wood carving that you spoke about, John, you know, was that person's ability to carve that thing, only what they knew, and that's what you got. It's one very specific, unique, one of a kind carving. Mm. I'll say in regards to compromise as well. Don't look at it all as a negative either because sometimes there's magic that happens within a compromise that never would have been there if you <laughs> had yep. what you wanted in the first place. Absolutely. Hard agree on that. I think yes. that like ultimately you can look at compromise as being an opportunity for accident and an opportunity for happy accident, I guess. I, mm. I don't know. That's a terrible turn of phrase. But compromise no, really is good. the opportunity. David, David Lynch is in the building? There you go. Yeah, compromise is definitely the the thing that w where creativity flows the most. Yeah. When you can't have everything you want, you have to come up with an idea how to make something better yeah. or how to make something work. And often that's the the moment where you really get an, and I'm, I'm using the same words over and over, and it's a frustrating thing for me. I think I'm too many beers deep. The uh, the opportunity to 
flex the creative muscle results in a better creative vision at the end mm-hmm. of it. And ultimately, I think that's the thing people connect with is the creative vision. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. Mitch, I was curious before, what was the question from Reddit? <laughs> oh, yeah. I was going to say that. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Turning um, time back to an hour ago. <laughs> um, the question from an hour ago. <laughs> Is this something about compromise? Uh, I'm <laughs> oh, so absorbed. Yes. Um, uh, if it's a Reddit question, is it uh, who would you rather fight, uh, one horse-sized duck or a hundred duck-sized horses? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, 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 think I, I think I prefer that question. Can I have everyone answers on that question, please? Uh, yeah, I would take the hundred duck-sized horses. Me too. Like, really? Have you ever fought a toddler? Not to talk about my, my past, right? Have you ever been bitten like, by a duck? Fighting, <laughs> fighting a toddler, that's an easy situation. Like, you can, you can, you can batter a thousand a toddlers number. before they can overwhelm you. It's true. I got, that's a, it's, I got it's a lot of toddlers, by, I know. I, got bitten I imagine it's true. When I was like 11, and it drew blood. <laughs> Well, then consider how terrible the bite from a horse-sized duck would be, Mitch. Yeah, no, good, man. Oh, my God. It's a hundred duck-sized horses. So if there's a hundred of them, they're tiny horses. You just kick them I can kick a tiny horse. Yeah, you can kick a little horse. Dean, Dean, which one? Let's go go across the table here, right? So I'm going to say 100 uh, horse-sized, duck-sized horses. Dean, what was your answer to this? I am exactly of the same opinion. I could yeah. keep their hundred of them Because it's the correct opinion easily. to have. All right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like yeah. a normal size. Mitch, you're going is... with the... No, I would, I would also have to go with the, uh, the, the uh, duck-sized horses. John? Horse-sized duck for the challenge. Do I, I like get, it. Do I, I can understand you know, that. What are the stipulations of the fight? Do I, can I, am I, am I, do I get to sneak up on the duck? Is it just, are we in the pit? Does the duck have like some kind of like weaponry? Do I have like weaponry? Is this just like... John, I think it's the Thunderdome. I think it's that two men enter or one man and one horse-sized duck enters like and the then Thunderdome. one that's horse-sized fucking, duck That's old mate pit. <laughs> the old mate pit. Bare hands, bare wing. Seen a horse... A horse yeah. that can <laughs> fly, rules. or a horse that can swim. The size of that, and you want to stare at that in the face, John, on land, when it could fly and swim, and just be like, I'm going to take you up. I was going to say, it doesn't surprise me that John wants to fight the fucking giant duck. <laughs> Mason, what about you? I feel like you'd win too, John, to be honest. Easily. <laughs> I kind of think so too. I don't stand a chance against that fucking duck, but but John, you'd have you'd have a lot of duck, and duck is like you have like something to eat afterwards. Like let's see if you eat duck, but you know that's a horse lot of meat duck. is also a pretty tasty, a succulent like, like Chinese a meal. Fucking little horses, chuck them in the fridge, <laughs> chuck them in Ziploc bags. No worries. <laughs> make some money, right make some money selling them to pal. Yeah. So the. The real Mitch question is, what would the corner yield with your little fucking thing? more food? No worries. A horse-sized duck. Or under duck I love it. Mason, so what, what do you got for us? <laughs> are, you, are you fighting a hundred... <laughs> no, I, agree with you with the, I agree with you with the duck-sized uh, horses, because you're right, you would just sit there and kick them all. They would <laughs> run at you. But like, yeah. And also, I don't know don't if this is just me being a sound guy here, but also like... <laughs> The sound of it, instead of a no, it's going to be really small. <laughs> it's just going to be so jolly. Whereas, a horse-sized duck, quack, quack, he's just going to be like, quack, quack, the sound of it. And it's not going to be this like petty thing. It's just going to be the sound. I, what would be the sound of that? I don't know. My mind is, you know, it's just post-production all over again. I don't think I, think I don't think a horse-sized duck could even actually carry the weight of its own bill. I think that shit would just be he'd just be hanging his head the whole time. I think it'd be an easy. You think it'd be the head? I think the legs would be the thing that would give out. Yeah, they would also give out. Wouldn't it all be let's, uh, let's not actually ever answer. Maybe or maybe not. I think that at the very least, all we should do is never answer this Reddit question and inca- yeah, instead just continue to, to go down. <laughs> instead, just continue to go down endless random paths. I think the thing that we've determined is that four of us could probably fight a hundred duck-sized horses, and one of us could definitely fight one duck-sized horse. Yeah. Put it in the movie. One horse-sized duck. <laughs> All right. 
Reddit question. What is it? Or what is it, Mitch? I don't want to know. I don't know. What is it? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. We're getting we're getting genuine questions from people interested in what we have to say. I'm gonna I'm gonna answer this question. We are all gonna answer this question. Um, how did each of you land your first gig? Yes. Now I'm assuming that's a film relevant gig. <coughs> Could just be any other random job, but I would love to know how you each got your first uh, gig. Someone and if not the, the very Olympics very school. very first one, then yeah. the first like I don't know pivotal one or the first interesting one. Um, I guess. I don't know. It's a weird one. I guess if you want the honest answer, it was exploitation. <laughs> isn't it? Isn't it all? And it wasn't exploitation from me to them. It was I like I was. Bribery. I was just a young guy who wanted to do things in film, and then ended up just fucking working for some guy who needed somebody who did something for fuck all money. Yeah, and I don't that's know. If any that's how it usually goes, right? In the entire film industry. Yeah, I was yeah. about to say that's everyone's answer because that's how you begin. Yeah. And that's not where we want to be. Like we all, I think we all came from a, a moral high point where we're like, no, like an unpaid internship or whatever is the devil's work. Or I, I don't fucking know. Like uh, everyone should be making uh, industry right straight away. And I would argue tooth and nail that everyone who has a creative ambition and puts in the work should be making a fair wage. But at the same time, I think all of us started off doing fucking nothing for nothing. Could you imagine, though, in yep. any job, if on the first day that you had no idea about, like, let's say, I don't know if any of you can bake cakes, your first day of baking cakes at this new bakery, they paid you, like, a serious wage. And you have no idea how to bake these cakes. Like, most of, in that scenario, most of those people would fail. Hands down. Down. You know what's I think a lot of the learning comes in the free failure at the beginning yeah. where there's no consequences. We can fail mm. and it's okay. Mm. We learn from it and then next time when we make the next cake, we get 20 bucks. You know, what's an interesting point. You know, you know what's yeah. bizarre, Mason? My first job was an apprentice pastry chef. There you go. <laughs> I was about to say that just Jesus. before you said that. And have a guess how much I made a week for a 48 hour week, starting at 3 in the morning. 48 hour week. $118. 48 hour week, 3 in the morning, apprentice. Yeah, that sounds about right. Thank, thank <laughs> $118 a week. Oof. A this week? Is back in here. 48 hours? Yeah. What is that? 46, 46 hours. No shit, I've got the pay slip somewhere in this house. Mm-hmm. And this is back in the, this is back in the 80s, them. so I, I don't know what it is. Shame. With inflation, I don't know what it would, it would be now. It was in that'd the be 80s. Like, that'd be like, what, maybe one dollar would be like... Uh, I'm going to say with inflation, it's like $125. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, know that, I know that early 90s was like $2.18 to a $20, dollars So let's say, let's say $2.50 to a dollar. $2.45, yeah. Well, wow, fuck, it's still shit. It. Disgusting. Yeah, Sorry, I'm uh, I'm straying away from the question. Somebody else. Yeah, that was. I, I mean, I was that was really insightful, Dean. <laughs> I think that was a. Answer the question. Yeah, but what about what about your <laughs> yeah. first acting, acting gig? Um, what about your first uh, acting gig, Dean? What was what was yours, and how'd you get it? I'm, try, I'm trying to remember what it was, man. Um, is it, do you mean like first acting gig? That's actually you got. You did the audition. You got it. <laughs> you got it, and you were paid. What do you mean, no, just like some joking. student I film? Or? I don't know, it could, could be anything. What was what was the first gig where you did as an actor that you were like, right, I'm, I, I think I'm a fucking actor? Now I can call myself you know an what actor. I mean? uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I did, uh, I played a fireman in a telly movie, and I think I had maybe four lines. And it was opposite, uh, I think it was a true story, it was opposite. Somebody who's a name whose name escapes me right now, which is ironic. Uh, and the, We're going to say are, Hugo Weaving just I'm, for a point of contention. I, yeah. No, it wasn't Hugo Weaving. I wish it was. But I, I landed the job because I think because I'd done previously done a um, like a paid casting director workshop with. Uh, mm with Faith Martin, and uh, I think she kind of liked me, but yeah, obviously I was green as hell, and she brought me in to meet this director, um, 
the guy of Andrew Keatis. You know him, John? Peter Andrew Keatis. Uh, yeah, he just greenlit me for this uh, for this small role as a fireman. And I uh, Sweet. I didn't realise until I saw it on TV that all my lines were in the wide shot, so you could you couldn't see me actually say the shit. I was like, that that happens yeah. a lot. You're fucking disappointed as hell. Another thing I learned, like this is off off the the uh, away from the question, but there was a guy who was in the fire truck with me. We were both mic'd up in our helmets. Oh no, I was mic'd up in my helmet. He was an extra. Um, and this dude was talking shit about people like the first AD or whatever. Like while I'm mic'd up. He was he was green too, and I'm I'm going like pointing my hat, just going like, shut up. Like he kept talking shit about him. I'm like, that's that's a mistake you should not make as an actor. Be aware when you have lines, when you're not acting, someone can hear what you're saying all the time. Oh, and as a general rule, don't insult the first AD, who no. is the hardest working motherfucker. Oh, exactly, set. yeah, exactly. The, the flip side yeah. of that was um, uh, being on set. The flip side, I remember being on set for this ad, and um, the uh, the sounds soundy was a bit of a bit of weird guys always listening to everything, and we're just kind of hey, he's a lovely guy, but um, we're just fucking around. We're standing on set, and you could see him like yeah. fuck around and like listening to things and whatever. And I'm standing there with the other actor, I'm like, what about that fucking soundy? What's up with him? He's a bit weird. <laughs> Yeah, we're looking right at him, and I see him just look up, and he's like, <laughs> and then sees him, and he's just like, "Oh, you bloody kids!" But uh, that was uh, yeah. that was pretty fun. But uh, I love it. fun. Talking shit. Um, I'll also say, on the list. Mitch, your first gig. Oh, sorry, Dean, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, man. I'll also oh, this is an advice for actors. If there's any actors watching this, I mean, I love sound guys, but don't ever allow them to make you fucking speak up. Like to satisfy mm. them capturing it mm-hmm. because you mm-hmm. your performance will be too fucking big. It'll, it'll look you're doing yourself yeah. harm. Agreed. If you perform into that, like fine. I think that I as, know, it feels. Yeah, you go. I, well, I was going to say that I think that me and Mitch would both agree on that straight away by saying that, like, as a director of photography, I don't want anybody to. And this is maybe a, a personal preference i guess i'll say or like a philosophy i don't want anybody to change their performance to suit Mm. what i have created i think it's more important for them to do their creative part and then for me to accent that as best i can in the same way that like dean if you were walking around the set and you walked into part of the set where i hadn't fucking put any light yeah go for it mate like oh no that's that's your creative choice i would say i would say though like as an actor you need to be aware of the lighting and you do need to somewhat have in some part of your mind that, that you do need to hit the best the, the points for the cinematographer because you're going to be out of fucking mm. out, of, out of focus. You're going to be casting shadow on people's faces. But you need you need to be in two minds. Like, a, yeah, so I, 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 I if, love that you the, yeah, say that. Could, but. If you could see the boom and you had to be in a specific point for the boom because it wasn't a movable object. Mm. then I would say there's a point where you have to be aware of how you can speak up. But the whole point of it is you're bugged. You've got a thing on you. It's, it's exactly, you. yeah. I mean, you know? Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. Back in the day, they had to, and you could see the result where they were speaking up, and it was this big theatrical kind of thing. Yeah, and then, like, in the flowers, they had a microphone that was, like, barely hidden, just, like, just, yeah. like literally just sitting there, like, mm. like uh, ha, 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 <laughs> or in their hair or something weird. Yeah, but that's some great advice, Dean. And I think that, like, I, I guess I just want to reiterate that if, for me, my creative process would be very much like, you want to be over there, cool. Like, this is the take that we got you, and you fell into shadow. Let's next take. Let's adjust this so yeah. that you can do yes. the the thing that you envision for the character. Because I think mm-hmm. that that's. I mean, it comes back to what I was saying before about the the picture, and I'm sure that sound people would agree. Ultimately, these things just need to serve the story, and the story is defined by the people in the story and the person who is telling the story. Mm. Yeah. But again, we're off topic. Mitch, your first gig. Tell us. First gig. Um, I guess it's an old one as a director. I made this movie called Old Mate. It was a weird one. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't actually have a career yet, so once I've made it, I can then say I have a career. No. Um, yeah, no, I guess I had a lot of odd jobs that led to going into directing. Um, but I guess the break into the film industry itself was two contracts kind of at the same time, one for visual effects and one for animation. So there were actually two, I was in two different departments doing work from, from both. So some of it was CG and compositing and then some of it was actual 2D you know, um, cartoon animation uh, for a Netflix series um, called White Rabbit Project in 2016. Um, That's a decent first with yeah. the three other... Well, yeah, I mean, again, it wasn't, like, the first one. I'd done a lot of, like, visual effects, whatever, before that, but that was, like, breaking into the building with people doing things, and it was happening, and that was probably the first... I mean, it was the first thing in Sydney. Um, so I would say that would be, like, the notable thing. I'd already been doing maybe three, four years of just like whatever short films and stuff mm -hmm. um, and had done a lot of live stuff and uh, had a lot of other kind of editing gigs and I was even a sound tech on the AFL um, so I had a lot of those kind of bitsy bobsy things that I could sort of go oh yeah if I wanted to pursue that I guess I could call myself that but it was fundamentally I think this and um, uh, the did it, did it manifest as a re sorry man pardon me did it manifest as a result of all that those small things that you did and like a network thing where it, where it led to the real job? Well, ab absolutely. Where it was yeah. sort of like within this gig, I don't even remember telling anyone, but one yeah. of the producers um, contacted me maybe two contracts later um, and said, I remember you mentioning that you're getting into directing. Did you want to direct a TV series? Mm. And I was like, I don't even remember... I remember talking to you at the coffee machine a couple of times. Yeah. You know, it was just a different producer on a different job. Wow. Um, and so that was a, like a kid series that I then did to that same company. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I don't, I don't know. But um, yes, that, it was above minimum wage, but I definitely didn't get the sense that there was, a, there was an element of um, I was young and didn't know what a rate looked like if it hit <laughs> me in the face. So I think there was, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't I don't think, you know, they thought I was capable, but I don't think they thought I was like overwhelmingly the best person for the job. I think they thought I was the best person for the budget they would like to have. And there's um, nothing wrong I'm, with that, I'm though. Very no, thankful no. for that. I think that like we've all had, you know, like just about every DP in at least Sydney, right? Like we've all done a lot of music videos and small corporate things and whatever. And a big part of that when we're young is we don't really understand the value of our work. And maybe mm. that's okay, because maybe when we don't understand the value of our work, our work ain't that fucking valuable. You know? That's mm. it, Mason, with the, with the bacon cakes that would... Yeah, yeah. Uh, ultimately, what we're talking about is yeah. some horrible fucking late-stage capitalism shit, where it's, like, <laughs> it's, it's really all about value. And I have discussions with young DPs all the time, especially in the position I'm in now, where it's like, yeah, man, you can make the best thing you possibly can, but if no <laughs> one wants to pay you for it, then it's not a career. It's an yeah. artistic aspiration. And... I'm all down for that, but if we want to make a job out of something, ultimately what we're serving is a corporate interest. We're serving... I need that cash uh, money. Exactly. It's like if you, if you charge, you know, say you're directing a role and you charge $12,000 to put together the pitch and you charge $12,000 for your labor and your idea and your IP, if that doesn't somehow result in the company making $12,000 more, then nobody's going to pay for it. And that's unfortunately the world we live in. Mm -hmm. It's true, yeah. However, having said that, uh, art is still the key aspect of what we do here in filmmaking, and no part of it is commercialized, and we should also all just aspire to make the best possible things to creatively satisfy ourselves. And that's Trick why rocks. I think this movie is... Yes. <laughs> um, this movie particularly, I think, is important because it is uh, everyone's... Just the, so many people that I've met, I, I'm seeing their creative spirit being just stripped away by the corporate jobs that, yeah, there's good moments. Yeah, some of the shots are great. Yeah, some of the music's awesome. Yeah, some of the performances are great. But fundamentally, it's, a, it's just fucking to sell people more shit they don't need. And it's like, let's actually do something that... Uh, 
let's bring the, brings the light back into the crew and the cast and the and the you know and the people watching it because it's it's not made to <laughs> sell you something you don't need. Yeah, John, what do you got John, for us? John, yeah. <laughs> I think my my first job straight out of NIDA was uh, straight out of acting school was um, it's another one of these. Uh, yeah, you just know someone who knows someone who knows someone. And um, being a Tassie boy, I, I was there's a, a wonderful director who was at uh, NIDA, Kai Raisbeck, who uh, <clears throat> I've worked with a couple of times. And uh, yeah, there was a little opening in. Uh, <laughs> I, now, when I think about this job, it was so cool. So you, you guys all know Port Arthur, like the penal colony down in Tasmania. Mm. They do uh, little 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 like panto shows twice a day down there. Um, that are little convict convict pantomimes basically, and uh, yeah, uh, someone was <laughs> not doing it anymore, and he asked me if I wanted to come down and straight out of night, I just spend three months in in Tassie, um, down at Port Arthur, doing these uh, doing these little plays twice a day, and uh, that was fantastic because there's nothing Sick. down in Port Arthur. Oh, we man. had like there was a pub, down, a terrible pub down the road. Um, <clears throat> we had our hotel. Not our hotel, just like the rooms we were staying with. So it was just all we did down there was like rehearse, do a show, hang out in Port Arthur, and watch fucking eight seasons of Supernatural, which was fantastic. But um, <laughs> you so made it that, that far? <laughs> oh yeah, no, dude. Honestly, in Port Arthur, there is nothing, and we we go stir crazy. And there was a th- there was a three of us in the play, and we're sitting there, and we just. Be watching Supernatural and all day, every day, just being like, Sammy, Dean, Sammy, Dean. Because that's all they fucking say in that goddamn show. <laughs> but, um. Saying Dean is not that, that bad. Thing. Sorry? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a good one, no. but, Saying um, Dean is not that bad. I, thing. But when I think back. To, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But when I think back to that job, it was, uh, on. it was such a perfect opportunity of, uh, for for someone who's just come out of like acting school and uh, there's you know you get being, get pulled every di- mm. different which way and you get sick of the politics of shit and in a big city when you're literally just in a tiny little town barely any internet with a couple of actors and you're just working on something and you're just doing testing out what the fuck do I even know about being an actor. And that's, you know, that's obviously we had a director, a director a as well, similar... that's working with the show, but um, yeah. Was it a similar thing to, Sorry? have you heard of Old Sydney Town, John? Have you heard of a place called Old Sydney Town? Yes. That's now, it no longer oh, exists. Ask you. Yeah, 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 Old Sydney Town, I know. Yeah. This is like a, an olden day thing, but it, but it used to be an immersive uh, town that was, you know, like early Australia. Um, and then you'd, the public would walk within the actors portraying shit constantly all day. Like, oh, that's cool. Going to court, that's people great. being whipped, people, the soldiers would like bail you up and uh, as if you'd done something. Like, was it that sort of thing? No, no. So we had, we had uh, three specific plays of, uh, they were like 20 yeah. minute plays of which we would, uh, we would perform at uh, sort of all three of them twice a day. And uh, it was mm-hmm. fun. So what we what we kind of do is like half an hour before or twenty minutes before the, we'd 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 kick off, we'd be in costume wandering around Port Arthur, just Port Arthur, just going the play's about to start, and blah, 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 just carrying on, just spruiking the show. And they mm-hmm. they all had signs and whatnot. But yeah, it was just like um, yeah, three plays twice a day, um, in a in a couple of different locations. Cool. And uh, if people were there, and they'd watch it. If they weren't, they wouldn't. You know, it was. Uh, but you know, we got got good crowds every yeah. day. But um, yeah, that was. It was yeah, just straight up the the experience of yeah, cool. doing a play in fucking Port Arthur, a beautiful location. And um, I got to tell you about you know down in Port Arthur they do ghost um, ghost tours and all that kind of thing. And Port Arthur is a very creepy place. Oh, nice. And um, obviously. When you're on a tour with all these people and whatnot, you know, it's pretty pretty creepy and whatnot, but us living down there, no one was allowed on site after dark. Like, there might have been a security guard about, but I obviously, a couple of times, Ooh. snuck into... Because of the ghosts, obviously. Snuck obviously. into Port Arthur at, like, 2 a.m. by myself, wandering around old 
penal colonies. And I had two experiences that yeah, were yeah. like, that's fucking cooked. Um, one was there was this old church which got which got burnt down. Yeah. Well, it didn't get burnt down, but the roof was all burnt off. So all the buildings there are just wonderfully preserved, and they're still like basically how they are. Oh, but there's a, a number of buildings that are all, all um, either burnt down or, or you know, damaged from whatever weather event. But um, there's this one church with a house with the, where the roof got burnt off, and um, it's got a spiral staircase in the middle of it. And I walked up the spiral staircase, just going, oh, oh yeah, cool. No. It's about two a.m. And I start walking down, and I hear these footsteps behind me. And um, no, just go, fuck that, no. and just sprint out of there. And I just hear them just come. The footsteps, a second set of footsteps, come outside of the church a little bit, and then dissipate. That one, I go, all right, maybe it's the echoes of my own feet, and I'm just scaring myself. But the 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 second time <laughs> was uh, the second time, which was on the same night, which is w- w- I went, no, nah, there's just I I don't I don't understand. So I'm at, um, walking across this big clearing. <laughs> oh, is my internet going in and out? The, 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 oh, the, for me, is, is anyone else seeing the same Yeah, it's yeah. happening to me as well. It's the ghosts. I don't yeah. want the story it's told. It's the ghosts. Keep yeah. talking. No, but like... It's stayed really It adds big, to the narrative. And, um, and just sort of wandering around, and then I kind of see something a little bit in the distance. I'm like, oh, fuck, shit. Oh, I think there's someone's coming. So <laughs> I run and uh, to this tree, and I'm hiding behind the tree. <laughs> And I look back, look out, and I see this person, like, where the clearing is. And I'm like, oh, fuck, it's a security guard now. And I um, pop my head behind. And then I look look back around, and there's about three seconds had gone past, and this person had moved about 60 metres from where they were the uh, first point. And they were just yeah. walking slowly. And I just went, "That's you can't, oh, no. that's, you, you can't. You can't get from that point to that point in that amount of time. And um, then I fucking looked wow, a third dude. time and they were gone. And look, you know, mine's you, no. when you're in Fuck that situation, guy. you want to believe these things, you see. But that was a fucking person who moved 60 meters in like three seconds and they were casually walking. I'm just like, no. Nah. No. Nah. <laughs> Oh, For those listening at home, it is 10 p.m. at night. I'm going to go immediately from here to try and fucking go to sleep. I'm now not going to. Thank you, John. Fuck yeah. <laughs> you all need to believe. That's great. Also, yeah. we're watching so so much a, a whirlwind story. Anyway. That doesn't matter. Maybe that's good. Yeah, because I'm doing it. John, your story might take the cake here, but now I, I need to hear, Mason, what was your first gig? My first gig was uh, in... in Port Arthur, right? <laughs> With ghosts, something about that. He was making these really echoey footsteps for a client in Tasmania. Yeah. <laughs> Mason, 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 were you the extra in that fire truck? <laughs> <laughs> he was the soundy, actually. <laughs> yes. Sorry, mate, go on. Thinking about it, like, it always goes back to this one, the, the real, real first one, which was like... It was just, uh, I was in year 12, and it was just one of, no, sorry, I was in year 11, and, and this director was in year 12, and she was just trying to do something outside of school, not for an assessment, just her own little endeavor, and she messaged me, and I, I didn't feel like I was a composer, I didn't feel like I, I just wrote music, I was in a lot of bands, and just, blah, but then she was like, do you want to do this short film, and I've never done it, and I had no idea of the craft, I was 10 minutes. It's just 10 minutes. Oh, actually, it may have been a little bit longer. No, sorry. It was half an hour. I do remember Ooh. this afterwards. It was quite a feat of engineering for, at the time, I was just nowhere near qualified, uh, educated. And this was just one big-ass master's degree that went for three months. It was it was just something oh, wow. I, had, I had never done before. And shout-out to Cherie, because I still work with her to this day in a lot of other different aspects of commercialized work and companies that she works for and um the most previous was like uh, perth horse racing last year and a few other like niche living we did a commercial for them as well when she went there and it just started back in the day of just like hey i got this thing do you write music for it and i'm like oh yeah okay um and it took me three damn months 
something that could be done in a fraction of that time now, but it was one hell of an experiment and after experiment. There were songs on there that was a full montage of me just chopping paper and, and making a song out of the stationery in the office of the scene. Get real weird. And the film had this... It's called Sweet Dreams. Uh, and it was about this sort of demon cursed in the in like her mum's jewel and it comes out and and it just had so much weirdness to it but it was unlike anything I've ever experienced I've never done anything so it was just me diving into the unknown and and it was like shown at Inalu cinemas she went to the nth degree and and all my you know all my school friends came there we watched it in a full-fledged cinema I had no idea what I was doing Sick. and it was that's cool the man because it had going back to what you said before um, Jordan as well. You know, I wasn't getting paid for this. And so it was just, there was no consequences. I was in year 12. We were all trying to figure each other out, figure each other, ourselves out. And there was just no restrictions. It was just complete freedom of art. That It, it was like the art was speaking to me. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I was just like, oh, I'll do it. But someone did say, they were like, would you like to do this? Would you? I, I'll, I'll push you in the right direction. Kind of like what you were saying before, Mitch. And she did. And I don't know if any of us knew what we were like doing. It was just kind of like, let's just try this out. And afterwards, I will never forget that. And I will never forget some of the music I wrote on it. Because it went, it was the first thing I ever did that had more depth than just like a, this is a punk song, yeah, yeah. Which is funny, because that's what I do every Friday. <laughs> um, but it, it had this like, every time we see the jewel, let's have a theme, let's have a sound. Let's refer back to that subconsciously throughout the scene when they're talking about it, but they're not talking about it. And having an arc to this 30 minutes over all these tracks, and I fell in love with the art form that was composition and filmmaking at that point. And it was, it was I remember after that, it took me a long time to say I was a composer. It took me a long time to, I went to Whopper to try and study composition, but if I'm really <coughs> honest, no offense to Whopper, None of my degree touched on writing for film within the composition stream. There was like maybe one thing uh, that I had to do it. We had to make like commercials for GLH, which is good looking hair, which is just a spray on paint where you would just paint your hair. Terrible products, but we had to make songs and that got me into like commercials. But it was working with the screen kids at WAPA that I eventually realized like, oh, composition was, was actually this other stuff. So mm. I went I went away, and during Whopper, while I was studying, I did my first feature film, which was Top Not Detective, which is on Amazon Prime, ladies and gentlemen. Sweet. That was um, a great time. Definitely it, check out Top and Not that, Detective. And that film was very much kind of like how all of you said you came to your project, especially you, John. You know, I was on tour down south with my folk band, These Winter Nights, and we were trying to break through the music scene as musicians, and we were on our sort of first tour, and it was a lot of fun. And... We were at the house afterwards and we were all hammered in the support act. The two guys in the support act were the musicians on Top Not Detective at the time. Mm. And we were just getting to know each other and talking with so many beers deep. And I remember sitting in this house down there and, and, and the guys were like, what are you doing Monday? Do you want to come into the, like, the studio? And it's very much how like, you're just like, okay. You have no idea. Kind of like what you said, Mitch. You're just like, oh, whatever. Oh, cool. And Monday I met the directors, you know, Dom and, and Adam, and, uh, sorry, Aaron, too. sorry, Aaron, Dom and Aaron, and they were just had this, like, uh, the energy about their story that they wanted to tell, and it was done on a much bigger scale um, than the, the short film I originally did in uni, but it had this, like, com complete desire to, like, dig deep into so many different things, and that's when I was, like, and that was a reaffirm reaffirmation, I guess, of me being like, oh, yeah, no, this is... This is exactly what I wanted to do. And I guess Old Mate yeah, was even a massive step further than that with you, Mitch, because this was a new level of understanding. This was a level of like, oh, I want to do this thing called composition, but I also, and this is not against anybody else I've ever worked with, it's I want to do it with the people that I actually enjoy working with. And I actually understand them not on a businessy industry level. I understand them on a human level. I know what they mm -hmm. do on weekends. I know what... Uh, what their interests are, I know what they, you know, what irks them, you know, all these kinds mm -hmm. of things, and you know them better than just the art form, uh, and then even just, you know, Jordan, this is our first meeting, and I've, you know, we've been on this for like two hours, and I feel like I now know a lot more about you, and I know about why you want to do what it is you want to do, and it, 
it's it's this is why I got into this. It wasn't for that paycheck, you know. And I've we've all I'm sure done those jobs where the paycheck's great, but the depth in the connection to the project itself was so minimal. Mm. Um, and it, and yeah, you, and every time someone speaks about that, like how was that? And, and sometimes it, it is great, um, but it didn't. It, you know, it usually does, it always speaks of like it was a great paying job. It was a great gig for the limited time. Limited mm. time. You know, the fact that mm. we've been on this for like three, three or so years, Mitch. Like especially from you and I speaking about this, it just feels like like it's just like my mates jamming. Like we just you know yeah, what we used totally. to do. We're just we're just jamming. Like pick that shit up. Pick up that instrument. You know, put that bong down. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's, it's, let's just try, and then, you know, and just like, you know, Dave Grohl speaks a lot about this in music, is just get in with the friends in the shitty instruments in the garage, and then I've been in that position and of where it's just like, you hear this idea come to life, uh, and it's so shit at the time, but in the moment, your mind is like, this is beautiful, I'm creating, mm. I love this, I want to do more of this, how do I do more of this, and mm-hmm. then we all perceive to go to university to figure out how to do, or, or any arts institution, or whatever, or YouTube to try to figure out the answers. How do I get into this? And really, you know, one of the best lessons I ever got, the best quotes, was just like, I know this sounds like one big Nike commercial that just do it. Um, oh yeah. But there was like that's exactly what this guy I studied with in Vienna, TC Thomas Chase Jones. He did a lot of the old Scooby Doo cartoons back in that in the day. Oh, he, he used to do a lot of like the turnaround of music that he used to pull around was. You know, 15, 20 minutes, sometimes hours, you know, per day of music. And he just had this philosophy of just, he had this, he never had a writer's block because he just had this idea of like, just do it, man. Yeah. Mm. Like it had, it wasn't just about the doing it, it was about the shut up all your insecurities, shut up if you're not confident or if you don't have competence or anything like that. Just do it. Philosophy, you know? fuck it. Whether fuck it's it. the fuck camera, it. you know, all point it, <clears throat> speak the lines, just fucking. Do it. it. Do it. Um, and and that a lot. Of, if anyone else is listening and they're wondering, once again, kind of like what you were sort of doing, Dean, of how how you, you know if you're like how to get into this, don't even ask the question. Yeah. Just go do it. Yeah. Pick mm-hmm. your phone up, film it. Don't ask how did you do it. Rather ask like how can I do it? Like what mm-hmm. you know what what's the what can I just do? Just do it. Yeah. Stop asking questions. Yeah. And goddamn do it. And that's the biggest lesson I have. Yeah. Was, it was I got that in high school, was everyone's telling you to learn math and learn this, and you have to do it for the tests. And then you, had, you know, and you know, but there was this other project which was just like, you want to do this thing? I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll just do it. I guess mm. there was no more meaning than that, and I found meaning in just doing it. Yeah. That was it. Love that's it. My story. I say yeah. like, say it out loud. Can name I... name it what you want to do. For a start. Yeah. Even if it's write it down, say it out loud, don't be afraid to tell people you're interested in doing it. And then take action every day in some way of trying to connect to other people that, that want to do similar things. Mm-hmm. And I think that the, the thread through all of our stories is uh, connections to other people yeah, it is. in Absolutely. the same industry. It's such a huge and those relationships lead to stuff down the road that become your first job. When I came to Sydney, the quote that I was really sticking true to was success is being in the right place more of the time. Or yeah, success is being in the right place at the right time. You can't control when the right time is, but you can control the right place. So be in the right place mm. more of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Early on. I should have said that for Perth. It's so far away. <laughs> That's why yeah. I came to Sydney. So I'm in the right place. Early, on, early on, I was even doing things like. I think even previous to me getting that first job, I went to a film premiere. I met a couple of the actors that were in some of the smaller support roles. Added them on social media. One of them started a, um, a touch footy team. I noticed he you know, had a thing come up, like a post come up. I went, I'm fucking doing it. So I went and played touch football, drove my ass to Sydney once a week to play like a fucking nice. half an hour game. But everybody in the team was a director, a casting director, a producer. An actor. Oh, sick. And it what a way fun. to let your frustration out on the rest of the crew as well. Yeah. I got something even deeper for all of you. Even deeper, and Mitch is going to laugh at this one. <laughs> that first film I did had an actor called Coram on it. 
Hey! And Coram is the existence of Mitch and our relationship. So he was on this film, and I remember he was the coolest part of this Sweet Dreams film. I just thought he was giving it his all for one hell of a yeah for this short film. He was just he was nailing it, and I remember seeing him at the premiere in the cinema, being like, "You're sick!" And then we kept in touch, and then he's like, "I've got this film," um, and then that's how I met Mitch. Yeah. And it's like that was my first. You know, I love those. You just said it before, Dean, like connections, mm. they come back in other ways. And that's exactly yeah. what my first experience was, was like randomly, I'm still now working with the connections. Yeah. And as, as now that I've met Mitch, I've now met you guys. Yeah, man. And that has mm. now not led me from that first film has now led me to meet Mitch, which is, has now led me to meet you guys. Yeah. Which is or, why yeah. Yeah. it's worth being exploited early on in your career. <laughs> mm. I wouldn't say worth. I would never recommend it to anybody, but I think that you're right in saying that, Mason. Like, it very much is. Like, everyone talks about it's who you know, not what you know. And that's a, a toxic kind of way to look at things. I think that ultimately yeah. people are looking for a, uh, a person who is a craftsman, someone it's, who can actually... who like, knows that you know what you know. That's a very good way to put it. And I think that's, that's the situation we face. It's very much about... It doesn't matter if the network you have is Keanu Reeves and uh, big Hollywood directors or if it's just a handful of people you know. It's important to get out there and meet people who work at doing interesting work. And a big part of that too is meeting people who do something different to you. Like mm. DPs, I'm sure Soundies have a very much similar situation. I can't speak to anybody else really. But like... I know, thank you, John. I, I know a thousand other directors of photography. None of them have got work for me because they're all trying to do what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So some of it is about putting yourself out yeah, there and making meaningful, connections with, making meaningful connections with people who have something else to, to another, another creative ambition to offer, whether it's like if you're a visual person, meet a sound person. If you're a sound mm-hmm. person, meet a director. If you're an actor, meet a director. Meet a, uh, another actor. Meet another uh, script writer. Find someone who has something to add to your voice, not just someone who will tell you that your shit is That's great or someone who will compete with you. That's literally what these yarns are. Like For me to really speak to everyone in a different stage of the film, like I just never get to do this. And for anyone that lives in post-production, like this is been a beautiful experience for me mm. to, from, from the composer's perspective someone that is prominently predominantly sorry in in post like to come and meet the other people it, you're right it, is, it does help give everyone else a voice Jordan it gives us all a, a unique growth that is beyond the film it's like connections with others like we're making other connections and that's just awesome to me yeah man that's really is yeah I love, I love this. I love, I love all of this. I love that everyone's from the crew is meeting each other. I think this is fantastic. I have such long-standing relationships with each of you in so many different ways, and it's great having all these dynamics and just bringing them together. Um, this is this is awesome. Um, we are running pretty long. Um, I yeah. feel like I want to um, keep going on this forever, but let's... You're already going to have a hard time cutting this down uh, to something that's and actually... Like There's a lot of gems in this one. I hope you have yeah. no time codes, Mitch. <laughs> I, I have, I've written down a couple of time codes of some, of some fun things that happened. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, remember that for later. Um, uh, and not all of you are going to like that decision. Uh, you better not um, cut out your drunk, drunk and losing your sunglasses thing. No, no I'll leave that in just for you, Dean. I've recorded that separately, just in case. Keep it in, bitch. As a contingency. <laughs> I'm, legally, I'm legally required to copy down every part of this. Too good. Too good. For the, for the deposition that will be presented for Mason's case in 12 years for having cement in his lungs. Though let the record also show that he has hardened the fuck up. <laughs> yes! Wow, what a fun. Um, wow, that was... All right, old mates of the week. Oh shit, Mason, we've had we've had yours. Oh, who was yeah. the reason you? Somebody should define <laughs> to me first of all what is an old mate right of the week. Ah, uh, yeah, so we should tell him. Old mate of the week is one person you met this week who was a classic old mate. Now that term 
can span. They don't have to be uh, necessarily a positive, um, <laughs> purely positive influence, as, as in the case of Mason possibly getting <laughs> asbestos in his lungs. <laughs> um, but they're just someone that you're like, that was, that was just a, like, it, when you're referring to them later and, and you're referring to the story, you get your fucking old mate. All right, I'll go first because so I've got no way for you. Uh, on and the this weekend. is very specific so this, to other. There's this boxing competition called the Contender, which is really cool. <laughs> um, what <laughs> just happened? Sorry. What just happened? Sorry, oh, John, you're breaking up on us, oh, mate. Yeah, this is no good. He's frozen. He's freezing. We've lost Mason, He's but frozen. for a different reason. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mason's back. We've lost John again. We've completely oh, lost John we've at lost this John point. Together. All right, I'm going to... I'm gonna. Oh, hang on, John, you're back twice now. No, he's coming, he's gone. <laughs> can you hear me? I can hear you guys. Mason, yeah. did you just hold your license up to the screen? An old license where I had hair and no beard. <laughs> it seems like yeah, a dangerous game can, you're playing. Some, this somebody is like some identity screen, theft happening. Somebody could screenshot your address. One of the ten people that watch this... It's actually it's, it's all old information. Sorry, Mitch. Don't yeah. let the no, court... we've lost your video now. Maybe we can hear you properly. Don't Let's let the hear court what you have to say. see that you have kept an old license. You meant to destroy that shit. Are you really? Okay, can I destroy it on air so everyone can see that in court? While we're in court right now, I'm getting charged for other things. <laughs> yeah, you are. What? Whoa, something's that? going on over in Nigel's right, neck of the woods. His camera's he's gone off, and now he's being destroyed by a several to, necromancers. <laughs> A strawberry porn drink. Meters in a second, I think he's a ghost. <laughs> Either that or the strawberry porn drink is very strong. John, are you still there, mate? All right. Well, this has been a big break. Let's. Uh, his, his, let's... Feet is, his feet is live. He's just fucking around with something else. Um, are, we, are we chatting afterwards? Are we chatting afterwards for a little bit um, tonight? Yes. We will. We will. I'll mention we that will. In a sec. All right, we've, we've got John back. No, we've lost Mason. All right, Mason's back. Bloody hell, this is like a fucking film set all over again. It's hurting cats. I should have spent He's this. destroyed his license. This. That's a great job. All right. What happened? Jesus Christ. <laughs> Nigel, are you okay, my friend? Have you fallen down several flights of <laughs> stairs? The Has the, the floor to your... Yeah, that's a good move, right, mate. It flying, sounds to me right? like you've fallen through the floor of your apartment. It's like you're all right, we can hear you closet. loud and clear are now. Are there people chasing you? No, I'm closer to my door on. where it's okay. uh, where the Wi-Fi connects a little bit better. There's a mirror up there. Okay. Why is okay. the Wi-Fi outside your door? Oh, it's You've a got really cool uh, couple of lighting in your place, John. Yeah, oh. Did you see it in the first couple of episodes? It changed colour every now and then. It was a yeah, bitch. Yeah, yeah. It's like, is that like a things. strip? <laughs> like a light. Oh, yeah, it's a um, Philips, Philips Hue. Uh, lighting strips, they're fucking I cool. have that too. I have the same Sponsored one. by they're Philips. They're so here. good. You just fuck around with them on your phone. They're great. Uh, other LED sources are available. <laughs> <laughs> he just dropped some of them on the floor. Um, yeah, literally everything. Yeah, <laughs> my fucking TV fell off right out. Yeah. Oh, shit. Wait, you just break your TV. Well, the, the, um, I think the stand for it's fucked. But uh, that's all right. It's all, right. it's all good. I'll fix it later. John, you had an old mate story for us. I'd fucking love to hear. It's been such a suspenseful situation mate. waiting um, for you to come out um, of this. Yeah, my TV fell off my uh, um, off my table, and I think the actual the, the stand fitting is uh, busted. But that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> is the TV broken? Is it okay? The TV itself is fine, but the but the stand that it sits on is uh, is cooked. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, tune in next time to find out how John's TV is. <laughs> John, you've got an old man story for us. I need to hear it now. It's, it's been too long. John's TV stand. John's TV stand. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking old mate just gave out on me oh, mid-podcast. Does any... Go, John, take the floor. Does any... Oh, sorry, go. <laughs> <laughs> Are we doing our old mates now? Yes. Yeah, we're doing old old mate. (laughs) All right. (laughs) So there's this uh, boxing competition called The Contender, which is a really good um, show that uh, that this uh, mob puts on where uh, they give anybody who hasn't had a fight or has only had one fight or very little experience the chance to experience like a quite a large show sort of 
um, mm. uh, experience of having a fight. And they, it's a 12-week sort of training program. And um, I did it uh, last year. It's good fun. But um, That was the one I saw, right? Yes, correct. That was epic. That yeah. was so much fun. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah, invited to. I'm so sorry. Music, I was lighting, there. all the type of shit, um, which you don't really get in like reg- regular amateurs. But um, kick up. Yeah, basically they have heaps of people sign up for it, and um, you know, like a month prior or whatnot, they have a group sparring sp- sp- sparring session for all the all the contestants, so they can get a bit of a, a read on people and try and have good matchups from that. But it's a, it's a sparring session. You're there to just like have a bit of a laugh, fuck around, and um, you know, get matched up. And uh, I was helping out with it on the weekend because uh, they needed a couple of bigger bodies, a um, few big boys floating around like, hey, you want to spar with a couple of these guys that contend? Yeah, sweet, no worries. And um, yeah, had a couple of good rounds with some, with some guys and everyone's obviously been training, uh, working hard, whatnot. And there's this one dude there who's a bigger guy who's just trying to like run at people doing fucking this shit. It was really weird. I'm like, all right, what the fuck's going on with that guy? Where's he been training? And um, you got a bit aggro with someone in one of the rounds, which is just, you don't need to do. And um, they were like, right, you're going with big boys next. And I had a bit of a spa with him. And here's my thing. If you're going to go hard at people and like be a bit <laughs> aggro with them after the bell, then all right, I'm going to give you a couple of good rips. And uh, it was weird, this guy... Just stand like this. He'd come up. He'd just throw big haymakers at you and just fuck them off and just like jab him, hit him in the guts real hard a few times. But kind of you know, <laughs> beat him up a little bit over a couple of rounds, and um, that's all right. But afterwards, he's just gone up to you going, "Oh, yeah, you, it's, yeah, you, you're like that level above it." It's like what? You're talking fucking how much? How, how much? How good I was? I'm like, oh, yeah, cool, all right. Like I'm not, not, not greatest fighter in the world but I'm like it's hard not to be when you got this weird dude just throwing just fucking <laughs> lunch, lunch boxes at and um, he's like oh what you're, you're good like what what do I need what what would you say is my biggest problem and I'm thinking to myself fucking everything mate but, um, <laughs> I think I said to him, hey, you just gotta start off by just throwing straight punches like maybe start with a jab and work off that <laughs> And, um, oh, yeah, 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 what else? I'm like, fucking, we could be here all day. And uh, he goes, oh, where do you train? I'll be your sparring partner. I'm like, I do I, 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 uh, Kind of giving him one of these. He goes, I'll pay you. I'll pay you, uh, pay you $100 to, to be my sparring partner. And I'm just going, no, I don't, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to do that at all. It was just really, it was just really strange, too. I'm like, dude, you just, you just, an, you're an amateur with no fights. Like, go to a gym, you'll find guys to spar with, and fucking, you don't need to be paying some dude a hundred bucks to, to be your sparring partner. But it was, yeah, like it was strange. He was well-meaning, but I didn't quite understand what he was doing there because you had all these people there who had been working hard for you know however long it is, like trying to learn the craft of boxing, and then you have this one strange guy who's just walking around throwing fucking haymakers at people and then afterwards is like, oh, what am I doing wrong? I'm like, boxing is what you're doing wrong. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So that, anyway, I just had to be like, oh, you know, good, good luck with it, mate. I'm, you know, hope you do all right. But uh, that was that was, that was was my old mate for a week. This just odd, odd kind of dude who was, uh, I wasn't really sure what he was doing there. A <laughs> hundred bucks also. Fucking low ball offer, got to say. Yeah. That's the old mate. <laughs> old mate. Who have you got? Yeah. Dan? Jordan. Uh, oh, Dan, Dan, I, Dan. I, yeah, I guess. Dean, you want to go next, mate? Mine's oh, really, sh- mine's really short, and it's not from this week. It's from a couple of years ago. I was in Woolworths, and I, was, I had earphones in, but I had nothing playing in them. I don't know if I'm old mate or he's old mate. They could go either way. But I was looking at. We'll decide at the end. I was looking at yeah. I was looking at the DVDs that they have in Woolworths. And they're a pretty shit selection. And this dude comes up. Yeah, first of all, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, I have a massive DVD. <laughs> Old school. This dude walks up and he starts looking at them as well. And I sort of like nod to him. You know, we're both looking at DVDs, and he and he says, "I don't even know why I'm looking at DVDs. I don't have a DVD player." 
But uh, <laughs> sorry, mate. I couldn't. I, I got earphones in. I couldn't hear what you said. It was such an awkward thing to say that I thought I'd just lie and say that I, I couldn't hear what he said. I did hear what he said. So, mate, if, you, if you're watching this, you're a fucking idiot. Like, I don't understand why you had to explain that to me. It's always a wonderful thing when you need to explain exactly. to somebody, I'm going to lie to you because it's harder for me to tell you that you're being a moron. Yeah. It was weird that he was being a moron. It was weird that I lied that I didn't hear it as well. He's the old mate. Maybe, oh, maybe I was being empathetic. That it, maybe it was like a subconscious empathy that yeah, I was like, you, I don't you want to make you look like a fucking him idiot of... right now. Saying something stupid, yeah. So it's better old. for me to, to plead ignorance than for me to admit that you've just said the dumbest shit I've heard in years. Yeah. Thanks for saving for, but have you for guys, explaining the situation. Have you guys got Jordan? I'm still here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because I don't. Oh. Hi. Well, that's a shame, have we got, No. But have, you can't even hear him. But have, I have can't we got hear or see Jordan. We've lost Jordan. What? No, Mason's feet is there, but he's, he is physically not present. Um, I don't know where Jordan has gone. But can you, you guys see me either? Him? I, I, yes, I see Jordan. And we're not even fucking with you. We can genuinely, we're having a conversation. <laughs> okay. Well, because, yeah, when I came back from yeah, the Johnny, I sat down and everyone was quiet and just going, eh. Oh. That's yeah. weird as fuck. Did, did, did you hear my Woolworths bit? I heard your Woolworths sure. bit. I've got everyone except for Jordan. That's yeah, so Because crazy. Jordan, Jordan, Jordan really... Uh, Sorry to break this Jordan too. Really elo- you- Jordan really eloquently explained my situation and sort of summed <laughs> up the situation. And you missed it, so I look like a dumb fuck. You think? So, John? How long have you not had... You went... You were gone a while ago. So, how long have you... Jordan's how long been- have we just been talking to ourselves? <laughs> I just thought Jordan's been gone this whole time. No, he's there. So you you gave your entire old mate story and didn't even... <laughs> Jordan was responding to the whole thing. That's hilarious. <laughs> I don't know if this is a bit or not. I feel like we've reached this point where it's like, is this a joke? Right, or I'm going to refresh and see if I get Jordan back. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, we'll, sure. that. we'll put a pause on things for a second. He won't tell his old mate until then. Yeah, my old mate was pretty shit this week, I've got to say. That was well, pretty that good, I thought. It wasn't old mate of the week, it was old mate from a couple of years ago. Old mate of all it's time. Not, it just wasn't one this week. But, you know, besides a guy at the gym that slams the equipment right. all the it's time, and I, and I it's fucking funny. hate him. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if he's an, an old issue. mate, just on principle. Hey, can you, uh, can you see and hear me, John? I can. Hey, Outstanding. Hey, hey. I've been here the whole time well. watching you. We've and Mason just, just comes out. back Mason, in the room. We just discovered that uh, John yeah. hasn't had Jordan's feed, audio or vi- video, for a while. <laughs> like, a, like a solid minute. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah, when, it's so good. When I came back from the toilet, you guys are all just sitting there silently and every now and again would go, hmm. <laughs> 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 and I, I like started that. to... I started doing it too because I thought it was a bit. That's so funny. <laughs> this is brilliant. I don't know hey. if that's like the ultimate form of peer pressure or something, where you're just like, yeah, I'm just going to join in on this even though I fully don't understand what's Mate, going on. If, if you go back, when I come back from the toilet <laughs> and um, Jordan's obviously on a roll, you'll see me just go... Well, mm. that's, that's exactly what happened. So Jordan started telling his old mate story and then you started telling your old mate story and then your feed fucked out. I was yeah, wondering right. about that. Yeah. So did I just completely run over the top of your old mate story? Yeah, More or less, yes. Freezing. <laughs> <laughs> it was beautiful. I like to think that it's because the quality of my footage is so high that the bandwidth is just too much. You made you your phone fuck itself. You You're couldn't quite right. get all of it. <laughs> You're probably right. I'm on the laptop and it's a piece of shit. I sort of laughed my ass off because you both, you both started old mate stories at the same time and I thought, wow, I'm not the one's going to stop. Like, <laughs> we just kept going. I don't know what was the situation. And then I was like, started. surely I started first. There's no way John will talk over the top of me. Let's just do this until he shuts the fuck up. But you know, the brilliant thing is so from my end, when I'm editing this, each of you are uploading your own streams. So when I was freezing in the first episode, I had everything that happened to me during that. 
So what's going to happen know. is in the edit, both of your feeds are going to be completely fine. And you are just going to run over the top of each other. I kind of want, I just I'm want like a separate cut. I, I just want like, whatever this, uh, you, this Instagram highlights thing you do, I want it this week to just be John being like, did all of you lose Jordan for most of the fucking, for most of the last half hour? And just me being here like, aha. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> you lost me, right? <laughs> you can't hear what I'm fucking saying. It's great. <laughs> uh, it's too good. Jordan, you've got to do your Disgusting. old mate. Disgusting. week again then, I imagine. Yeah, my old mate, my, my old mate story fucking sucks in comparison, right? So, like, as we know here, I work as the head of uh, video department for Sun Studio, so I get a lot of weird inquiries from people who uh, want to be directors of photography or who are directors of photography. And we have some very strange discussions over time. Um, I'm going to say that I'm going to tell this story for all the listeners at home who have any interest in cinematography, and I'm going to apologize to the four wonderful gentlemen who are sitting in front of me who are not going to understand a single fucking word I'm about to say. So, I had a client come to me the other day, and he said to me, well, "Look, we need to hire up uh, three Alexa Minis and a set of prime lenses. Let's assume K35s. For those listening at home who don't know, a K35 is a set of prime lenses that is just about the rarest set of lenses you can possibly fucking find in the industry. So it's like somebody saying to you, "Hey, we'd like to hire uh, a bunch of cars, like six cars, but also one of them is going to be a Bugatti Veyron, and we're not going to talk to you about how that's going to be hard to find or why that would be impossible." The same client later came to me and said to me, uh, hey, uh, look, we've got this project coming up. It's just a solo camera operator. He's never, never operated a camera before. Uh, and we're looking at maybe an Alexa package for him because I think Ari is the way to go. We really care about skin tones. A stupid fucking discussion. Let's not talk about that. The next email I got from them was the most ridiculous part. And again, none of you are going to get this. So if you're listening at home and you understand what I'm saying, congratulations, you're in on the joke. They said, hey, I've been looking at Panavision lenses and I was wondering if you could supply some. There's a 19 to 90 that I really like and a 25 to 300. Is there anything that you could suggest that's similar or perhaps provide those? Where would I get those in Australia? Now, for those who are not in the know, Panavision uh, only supply their own lenses. I can't get Panavision lenses. You can't buy Panavision lenses. Nobody can do that. So somebody's come to me and said, hey, uh, I've got a shit project, which we're not going to hire you for because I haven't figured this out. Can you get me the rarest lenses in existence? No. Uh, Okay, cool. So our next project we've got coming up, can you get me a set of lenses that you physically can't have? (laughs) So for me, that's uh, old mate. (laughs) Old mate right there is like... Old mate, he's just not really like with it. He, he's pretending to be a professional, but doesn't quite understand what the fuck's going on. I've got a new old mate. I have to interject because Mitch just fucking texted it in the chat that even though I came back into this conversation and John said he couldn't hear, like couldn't see any of Jordan, that none of you can have heard from me because my microphone's been muted. For like the last, like, I don't know, ten or so minutes. <laughs> I just the thought you'd gone quiet for a change. No, I came in running. <laughs> I came back running. I was like, "Oh my god, guys, I'm still here!" Mason, um, and I was doing Mason this, is... and you know, like, I saw some I was of that. yelling into the microphone. And Mason is never not saw, making noise. All you guys saw were just Mitch. Mitch actually said that's that exactly what I saw. Yes. You weren't even in the frame. He, and he he left, and I couldn't see because you were still small at the time. She did walk yeah. away during whole John having an existential crisis over Jordan existence saga. <laughs> Which is even funnier that I came back into it with my own set of... Yeah, wow. Old mate of the week is the internet connection across Australia. And this, ladies and gentlemen, leaves us with the greatest question of the entire night. Is old mate truly the existential crisis of whether or not Jordan exists? Am I, in fact, an AI construct who has been created specifically for the entertainment of the viewers tonight? I'll leave that with you. <laughs> It seems so with lighting, with, <laughs> with lighting that. With, what just happened? I just looked back and he's gone. How did you do that? With lighting that beautiful, I, I question your reality with that lighting that beautiful. Oh, that was great. Wow. Look at well, thank you very much. Were you in, were you in Port Arthur that night? Were you gliding <laughs> across the ground even though you were walking at a leisurely pace? That's correct. This is the worst yeah, conclusion the, to a conversation ever. <laughs> we, need to, we need to have some kind of finality to this. I haven't even had an old mate yet. Oh, oh, oh yeah, please, Mitch, your old mate. I have had we, we the, the end biggest of weekend in a long time. 
That was, yeah, you heard the end of mine, regardless of whether there well, was a satisfying ending or not the, to the, that. The true, the true old mate is, is Jordan, who is possibly AI. Sorry, Mitch. That's great. Um, fuck, I forgot my old mate. Are you still there, John? Um, <laughs> Jordan, do you still exist? Oh, John, John, still, John, maybe. John still exists. Jordan still exists. Mason still exists. I can't hear John. Dean. John is moving Dean. very slightly, but he hasn't said anything for a while. And he's smiling, which means he knows what's going on here. Dean, we playing yes, the microphone. You, you, random, you randomly muting us. Yes. No, I have no. Yeah. I, uh, actually, you I, have no I, power. I may have control of this. I have no idea. No, <laughs> I don't know what happened with with uh, with Jordan for for um, John. I reckon it's what you said, Jordan. I reckon the feed was just so high quality. John's phone, which was the internet, was crap, and just had to lose something, and it just went biggest thing first. <laughs> I get that a lot. <laughs> Mitch, your old man story, please, for the love of God. Uh, my old mate, no more cold. Um, <laughs> um, Sunday night. So, actually, you know what? I've just changed my old mate. I- I'll tell you the, the brief, the first story very quickly, but then I'll tell you the real old mate of this story. Sunday night, Sunday day, two p.m. Um, we're downstairs at the new bar, Louis Bar and Restaurant. Amazing. Um, and it's a full Sunday sesh. They've planned it for a while. $3,000 disco ball. Just all its glory. DJ decks, DJs. It was sick. Um, the start of the evening, there was a, uh, an acoustic guitarist uh, performing. His name is Skivvy. And he is sick. Um, Samoan dude. And, uh, and then he and his mate, Junior, uh, who's also an absolute legend, around 10 p.m., came up to my place with the guitar. I bought back probably about half of the bar that was left to our place, and uh, and he and he was like he was playing for maybe two hours, and then there was a couple of DJs and stuff, and then he came up here and then played till uh, pro- probably midnight, I dare say, just like another two hour set, not being paid, nothing, just wow. for a, a pack. This room just absolutely packed with as many people as you. There was like eight people like crammed on the couch, people sitting on the table on every chair. I have this. Uh, Recliner wow. chair named Linda. Who's, <clears throat> once you sit in her, you never leave. You never forget Linda. Um, this was <laughs> place was packed, and then it was it was Skivvy sitting in my chair, facing everyone, just playing with my little uh, little. Was he? Amp. It was fucking sick. Is he a younger guy? Uh, thirty-two, and he's got a ten-month-old, and this was his one night yeah. he's had since having a kid, where he actually went out and was hanging out with his mate. Okay. Because I was going to say to Mason, like, how often do people say to you at your gig, hey, come back afterwards and play at our place? I'm like, no fucking way. No. I've never, no, never. I'm like, but they ask you, right? And you're like, no, fuck, no, sorry. I invited him back, didn't even mention the guitar. I was like, do you want to just come to our place with everyone else and just keep going? And then he's like, yeah, do you want me to bring the guitar? I'm like, are you? That is an old mate. That is an old mate. Like, yes. Uh, What an old mate, right? That guy we were talking about before, Corum, that Mitch and I knew, came to watch me play one of my gigs at the Indie Bar in Scarborough, and then he also dragged the bar back to his house. And we went back, started playing guitar, and then he just passed out on his bed. <laughs> so we were all just, <laughs> just partying, in partying in his house, and he was asleep. Now, <laughs> the last spin on this story that I'm going to do, though, is the real old mate of this story, which is my housemate, Harry, who... Uh, Four of you have met, and Mason, you saw briefly, I believe, in the, in the last one when he walked past. Um, now, Harry went to the gym a while ago and picked up a, uh, a deadlift or God knows what, and I presume that was when the incident occurred and he didn't notice. But when he woke up the next morning, uh, he had uh, incredible 10 out of 10 pain all the way down one side. Anyway, went and got a scan, and he has a bulging disc in his neck. Oh, it's pressing God. on a nerve, sciatica, down his side. That was probably, I'm going to say, close to three weeks ago now. Um, oh. If it's longer, I'm sorry that you've been dealing with that for even longer than I thought. Um, mm. And uh, absolutely horrific. And he's been on Endone for ages. Um, <laughs> he's been an absolute soldier through it all. But Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday from 2 p.m. until 7 a.m., we were partying. Him with a spinal injury. Oh my God. He is the Sesh King, and that is an old mate of the week. That is an old mate.